We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, Tom's got news about the weekend. I'm not sure if you wanted to say it on air. I think that's what you said you wanted to say. I'll say some of it, because uh, okay. it was a, it's, a, it's a long thing. But uh, So we got invited by friends to go to stay at a Disney property, which we haven't done before, because we don't make that much money. Uh, so and with three kids, everything gets real expensive real yeah. fast. But <laughs> yeah. uh, they all have worked for Disney all their lives and all this other garbage. So uh, they all have points and things and just, I don't know. Anyways, they were like, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. Just come stay. Okay. okay so we did. The... Coolest thing we did, yeah. The coolest thing we did was that we went to the Void, which I don't know if you've heard of. Hmm. I hadn't heard of it, but apparently they're going to open like six more locations. But it is essentially a an Oculus Rift powered virtual reality okay. experience, right. and it's all based on Star Wars. So you okay. are rebels that are dressing up as uh, stormtroopers, yep. and then you infiltrate a base to go see something, and then you shoot a bunch of people, and then you get out. Okay. Uh, theoretically, I guess I don't know. So I had never done VR before. Okay. Not in the, not in the the most late, the latest sense. So this was all Oculus Rift powered. I could tell because it said Oculus yeah, branded. It. So, sure. <laughs> I mean, it was they were branded. They want it. you to know which one yeah. you're using. Yeah. Big headphones. You know, big massive headphones. Uh, there was some, a microphone someplace in this thing. It was okay. probably in the visor. Uh, the visor. It was quite heavy, and mm. there was a jacket. There's a vest that you wore that would vibrate mm. and do other things. Okay. Uh, and you would you put this thing on, and like your arms, like when you oh, you stretch out your arms, you, you, they they were clad in the the armor of okay. the stormtroopers, cool, uh, and the everything on the walls and stuff like that would look different and all of that. So my kids loved it. I thought it was very cool. Okay. Uh, but, you know, there were still some pretty major tracking issues. <laughs> like, if everybody reached to do the same thing at the same time, like, 18 arms would appear out of yeah. nowhere right. and, <laughs> and go there. And it, you would go to touch something, and where you saw it and where its physical location was didn't sync up. That like, ah. it was an inch or two to the right. So they were almost doing an augmented reality, but in virtual reality. Well, it, 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 so there was a, uh, there, at the very end, there was a droid. There was like an R2 unit that was in the elevator with you okay. as you were doing whatever. And then when you stepped out, when you took your visor off or whatever, uh, there was really a droid there. Okay. But you could feel the whatever. But a lot of it was... Like I, I, I was re I was putting my hand on the wall and the wall just ended. Ah. <laughs> you know, I mean, but in the the, the VR, what you could see, it, which it it kept continued. going up, of course, right. yeah. But it was there was some cool stuff. Like you stepped out onto a platform that was over a bunch of lava, and you could feel heat, you know, on your face and all around you and stuff like that. Like I don't know if that was the vest doing that or if it was they had like a hot fan blowing yeah. on you. But uh, you know, there was some really cool stuff, and especially like when. The first time you stepped out of the spaceship onto this sort of floating platform thingy, uh -huh. you look down, you're like, uh, you're, it's, it's it's a metal grate floating over a, lot, a lava river, and you could feel heat. I'm like, I don't want to step on that thing. It doesn't look very safe. <laughs> I don't think I don't, I don't want to step on that. It was and it was it was a, it was quite disorienting mm -hmm. to moving. Just walking in general was right. very hard to yeah. do without because uh, your equilibrium was off, but. Very cool experience. So it was worth, worth like $38 a person to do mm. it. I don't know. About how long but, was the experience? Under 10 uh, minutes, about, I'm guessing? 15, about 15 oh, to 20 15 minutes. Oh, about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. It's not I too mean, bad. It's $2 a minute or $3 yeah. a minute or something like that. That's still pretty pricey. And they you know, they were shuffling people in there all day long. You had to make appointments and everything. But that was pretty cool. It all was right. pretty cool. So there was that. I also went to a dude's house who was extremely wealthy. Um and I uh, went into his home theater. It was like he's got this great, massive flat screen TV. Okay. 
and uh, some clip speakers up front, okay. like little small towers. Mm. Like I've never seen. I mean, they were real small. The center was pretty big at this time, but all the all the rest of the speakers were overhead speakers, and his his couch was all the way against the back wall <laughs> with the surround backs directly above his head, yeah, and uh-huh. his surrounds like four feet in front of him, to, all the way on the sides of the room. I'm like, oh, all that yeah. money. <laughs> money doesn't guarantee anything it still has well, to be put to good use i mean okay so you know i don't really blame people who end up in this situation because a lot of times they're they're trusting you know they're builders and they're sure, trusting everybody else to know what to do yeah. and they are at you know they they're i want to surround sound home theater well they got a surround sound home theater you know no one told them to put their couch back there though <laughs> no one in their right mind would have put the couch where it needed to be for those speakers to work like no one would have put a couch in that location there to block the door to get in. Oh, you know, yes, that, it's just, that is poor design. It is, you know, but they did get surround sound, so you know I can't really blame them, and I'm sure it's still a pretty decent experience in there. But you know, whatever. All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com, leave us a comment there. Facebook facebook.com slash av rant podcast youtube.com slash av rant you can contact us directly at uh, rob at av rant.com his, his twitter is at first reflect i'm tom at av rant.com my twitter is at av uh, at av rant underscore tom mm-hmm. uh, yeah and those of you that are wondering and you, by this point you aren't anymore because the podcast has gone up but uh, i did not post a podcast yet i was gone all weekend and i was gone from thursday till su- late ah, sunday okay and then today was my youngest son's birthday oh, so well happy I had, birthday i had yeah so he's nine years old going on i'm gonna kill him if he doesn't straighten up mm. so yeah he's at that age that uh-huh. age between i don't know where the end of it is <laughs> but it starts around nine <laughs> <laughs> you just are like I can't. I had to give uh, uh, today was 32, the first thirty-two nine to thirty-two. I think is the bad time. <laughs> twenty-five, twenty-five. I started like realizing Ugh. what a jerk I was at around twenty-five. Twenty-five so. is when I began all of my life's problems. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, so thirty-two. Yep. <laughs> thirty-two. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to thirty-two. I guess. <laughs> but my fifteen-year-old had his first driving lesson from me today, mm-hmm. so that was nerve-wracking. <laughs> and he he had a, he had only hit one curb, but we were in the parking lot, so it was okay. <laughs> All right, we want to thank our listeners of the week. To thank our listeners of the week, we, or to be a listener of the week, all you have to do is uh, support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is to go to www.avrent.com and click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, which will take you to a PayPal donation site. You can use your PayPal account or a credit card to leave us some money. PayPal handles all that. We never see your card number, nor do we want to. So we want to thank Corey, David, Michael, and Earl for being our listeners of this last week thank you Joan. yeah Corey, david michael and earl thank you so much for those donations uh cool to see that many people donating again so that's, I really that's nice to see wish i would have got myself a cup of water before yes i start this podcast well at some I point don't. i'll ramble on so yeah. yes <laughs> uh probably when you answer that question about app getting lossless audio from ah uh, yes which from devices Plex and that type Plex. of things yeah. yeah once you start talking about that i'm out gotcha. all right uh we also thank our 61 patrons over at patreon.com patreon is a service where you can sign up and it will take a monthly uh donation from your account and give it to the artists or our content creators of your choice so we want to thank our 61 patrons over at patreon.com yeah that is patreon.com slash av rant podcast if you would like to sign up and thanks so much to our 61 patrons yeah uh, if you can't support us financially just find some way to, find, uh, to support us and then let us know one way you could do that is by talking us up so bob told optima that av rent helped him decide which of their projector models to buy and rob m who is different than rob you uh emailed uh acoustic panels in canada to let them know he heard about them from us so thank you bob and thank you rob yeah bob and rob thank you very much for talking us up to those uh retailers and uh uh, congratulations on your purchases those will be yeah i'm I'm pretty sure that inci on the hub got got mailed yes i'm pretty sure yep that that should be out there hopefully joshua is enjoying that hopefully Emotiva has released their new Stealth Series PA1 Class D monoblock amplifier. This is in the news. Uh, it uses an ICE amp module rated for 140 watts into 8 ohms, 300 watts into 4 ohms, and a stable output into as low as 2.5 ohms. 
Yeah, I bet you better not go to 2.4, though. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. The Stealth series is targeted more towards professional applications, so that input is a combo XLR and quarter-inch jack, but they can accept both balanced and unbalanced signals, so a simple RCA to TS cable can work. As a universal power supply, they can be plugged into any outlet from 100 to is 264 volts at 50 or 60 hertz with automatic de de detection. They're small and fanless with high efficiency and good signal to noise ratio. They're $300 a pop. I gotta be honest with you, I am not a fan of the ice amps. Mm. But if anybody could do an ice amp right, it would probably be Emotiva. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the specs all looked good. You obviously can't judge everything by specs, but Emotiva no. is very honest with their specs. And their they specs are. And, good. And, and, the yeah. problem I've always had with ice amps is that, uh, you know, basically, for those who don't know, an ice amp module is made by Bang & Olufsen. That's right. Bang & Olufsen created the ice, amp, uh, ice amps so that they could make a small enough amplifier to put inside their ridiculously shaped <laughs> speakers. You know, they have these circles and, you know, that thing that looks like you should put your cigarettes out in it, stuff like that. Uh, so they, they, they want all their, their speakers to be self-powered, so they want these to be the amps. So they made these ice amps, and... It was what ended up being a pretty brilliant, though at the time I, I was perplexed by a decision. They decided to sell these things to just about anybody who yeah, will buy them. Yeah. So you can buy an ice amp and then put it in your own case and say, hey, "Here's an ice amp, and I've made it better by putting it in my case and sell it for a <laughs> markup." And people did that for a really long time. Oh yeah. Uh, and th therefore, we ran into issues with uh, some of the ice amp amplifiers being, you know, weird and non-linear and doing strange things because what Bang & Olufsen wanted them to do was not necessarily what everybody else wants them to do. Right. So because Bang & Olufsen has their own target curve that they were going for. And they designed so, their own drivers and their own crossovers and all this stuff so they can control the impedance at given frequencies and make it yeah. so that it works nice. Because uh, there's no reason why the ICE amp Class D amplifiers can't work nicely with a given pair of speakers if those pair of speakers have the type of impedance profile that works nicely right. with a class d amp it can totally work great and these are nice and small no fan in them so you're not going to have any right. noise uh very low heat and they designed it so that two of them can go side by side in a single height rack mount that was emotiva's choice to make them that type of shape and size so uh yeah lots lots good here in my opinion w worth a look if you wanted mono blocks with some yeah. pretty hefty power to them and like uh seymour av they have their ice block amplifiers mono blocks but one that's similar to this is about 900 dollars from seymour so uh right. you know 300 dollars each while not super inexpensive if you're gonna get 11 of them that's a whole lot of money but uh you know that not too bad for for a well-designed ice amp so good on emotiva hopefully someone will try them out and tell us if they work well or yeah not. The, i the the, the and my reservations really come from, I think, poor implementations in the past, and it was early in the ICE amp. And a lot of uh, that was power supply stuff, and EMOT yeah. was quite good with their switch mode power yeah. supplies now, so yeah. yeah. So probably won't have the same problems, but yeah. So Amazon Prime Video is getting Atmos support. Their Amazon original show, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, will be the first content on uh, Amazon Prime Video with an Atmos soundtrack when it debuts August 31st, which I will be able to stream, but I probably will not because I never stream anything from Amazon anymore. <laughs> uh, Amazon has only confirmed their Fire TV and Fire TV Cube as hardware devices that will output Atmos from Amazon Prime Video. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I have not been super impressed with their their streaming service, to be honest with you. Though, I think it's just more of... Like, I've really enjoyed Hulu, and I thought mm -hmm. I wasn't going to. And uh, I've been kind of stealing it from my friend, and it was working, and then one day it didn't work. And my wife looked at me and says, well, you're going to have to buy Hulu. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I have to buy Hulu. <laughs> like, it's, it's okay. We're buying Hulu. It's Time ours. subscribe. Ours. Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, it, Amazon it, and Apple seem to have sorted out whatever their kerfuffle was because Amazon Prime Video is now available on the Apple TV. So hopefully when the Apple TV 4K gets its Atmos update in the fall, uh, hopefully they're still playing nice with each other and Amazon right. will let Prime Video work with Atmos on that. But who knows? They're like, sure yeah, is. it'll work on our Fire TV. Haven't said anything about anybody else yet. That would be stupid if they just had it on the Prime TV. I will <laughs> say, though, that uh, I started watching Cloak and Dagger yes. on uh, Hulu, and that has been very good. My wife really likes they it. They went and previewed two episodes on Canadian television, but then, they, then they're like, nope, go over to this channel. And I'm like, uh, nope, not going to do that because it's only available in standard def in Canada. So nuts to oh. all of that. No, it is. It, the first episode was fantastic, but uh, it kind of s it slowed down a little bit. Nah. We're on episode seven here. Budget. All right. Yeah. David, 
David wanted to comment on the 95%. Uh, oh, these are comments from our listeners. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not reading the, t- the title headers here because I'm whatever. Wanted to comment on the 95% drop in bandwidth that Bob in the Philippines was experiencing when he tried using a VPN. David just wanted to double check if Bob is potentially using a cheap router or an older, not very powerful CPU. Since all data packets have to be encrypted and decrypted uh, using a VPN, having a low power CPU or a poor quality router can lead to bad bottle, a bad bottleneck with slow data rates. Just something to be aware of. And speaking of Bob in the Philippines... Bob tr- uh, tried a different VPN, but he got the same 95% drop in bandwidth. So it's either what David just said, or it's his ISP throttling VPNs. He did a big update last year and had fiber optic internet installed. So he's pretty sure his gear is up to date. I would not trust that. Google your gear. <laughs> uh, he did want to clarify that US, uh, US TV now is available to anyone with a U.S. billing address, not strictly military. No VPN needed, but they are just streaming U.S. network TV, so no premium cable channels, and it's just streaming live TV, so time differences and commercials are present. I wish I had known about that in Australia. I probably wouldn't right. have made a difference, but yeah. I wish I had known that. Lastly, Ken sent us an update. He asked uh, last week if the Denon S530BT receiver would give him a decent room correction at the lowest price for his 3.1 living room setup. Uh, it had no room correction, so the answer was no. He's, we suggested spending a little bit more on the Yamaha RXV383 to get at least basic wipeout. He decided he might want to plug in more than five HDMI sources, so he settled on a Denon S920W for $230 from Accessories for Less. That gives him H HDMI inputs and regular Odyssey Multi-EQ. Yep. So... Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. good. That's pretty. That's that's a nice choice. You'll see lots of people recommending the S720 or the S920 or you know the modern versions. I guess they're up to the uh, 940 and 740 now that have just recently come out. But you'll see lots of places recommending those as sort of their uh, you know entry level or budget level yeah. price for a receiver because really nice feature set, lots of HDMI inputs, and you know solid performance. So thumbs up to that choice. I think you'll be happy with that, Ken. All right, Will on Facebook. Will is using Plex. He already has a computer acting as his Plex server, and he is making full MKV backups of his discs that retain the lossless audio, the True HD or DTS HD Master Audio, Atmos or DTSX. Mm-hmm. Which st- okay, I'm about to get my water. Which <laughs> streaming boxes can play the full lossless audio using their Plex player? Can any of the following do it? Apple TV 4K, Roku 4, Xbox One S, Amazon Fire TV. I'm gonna say. <laughs> Ooh, I, this would be a total guess. I uh-huh. want to say the Xbox One S and the Apple TV. Am I right? Uh, well, it's a big old no to all four of those, oh, unfortunately. God. Now, not not because of the hardware. Like, obviously, the Xbox oh, yeah. One S, the hardware is capable of outputting lossless audio because the, it does yeah, so when yeah. you're playing back a physical disc. Uh, but the Plex app has not been updated to make use of that as of yet. Not sure why, but it hasn't. Uh, in fact, I had a whole long conversation with Chris Petrin, who we, we've talked about. Windows Chris, I guess we'll right. dub him. Had a whole long conversation uh, over Twitter uh, and DMs because the things got way too long, even for the new larger character count on Twitter. Um, but about the audio capabilities, because uh, I, I have a day one Xbox One. I never got an S or an X. I'm still on a day one version. Me too. And it has consistently been the case where uh, I do have the option of saying send the audio via HDMI, and I do have the option of saying send that audio as a bitstream, but then it gets mm. you to choose which bitstream you want it to send. Your choices are Dolby Digital 5.1, DTS 5.1, or now Atmos. Those are your bitstream options. Right. But what it's doing, my day one Xbox, for everything other than physical discs is it is decoding the audio from whatever it's whether that's a game or a streaming service or whatever whatever is decoding the audio internally Mm -hmm. uh, mixing it together with any other sounds like your alerts and your badges and all that type of noise and stuff and then putting it through an encoder and sending it out as a Dolby Digital which is why my surround back speakers have been getting lots of play these days right (laughs) but including the Atmos setting uh, you know, so I made a joke. I'm like, when everything is at most, nothing is. Well, that's really not accurate, but <laughs> yeah. it, it, it turns out like everything, even if it originated as stereo, comes to your AV receiver as an Atmos bitstream uh, out of an Xbox Which One. Which means and- it can't do any sort of up mixing or anything else. You can't fix it if it if it was two channels That's to right. begin with. Yeah, it can't fix it you're because you're stuck at, with that format. You're stuck with two channels up front, and <laughs> none of the all the other speakers are you know, are being. Uh, 
commandeered by the Xbox. And the Xbox right. is saying, play nothing through those because I, I'm giving you Atmos. I can tell you what yeah. to put in every speaker and you're going to put nothing in those speakers because it's only two channels. But it's like, uh, I, mean, it's, I guess it's an audiophile stream. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? It's, it's it, it, very, you get it exactly the way yeah, that, that for it was that, meant to be. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, but Chris was saying since he gets all the preview builds, he was like, he has an Xbox One X, of course. And of course he does. Um, he was like, oh, on Netflix, and I believe he said also on Hulu and Vudu, although I might not be 100% right, uh, but not on Amazon Prime, uh, but on these other streaming services, they were able to switch between, so like if it was Dolby Digital Plus 5.1 in the original stream, which you can look up in the information right. on Netflix, right. that's what his AV receiver said on its front panel. And then when it was actually Atmos from Netflix, it said Atmos on its front, it was switching just like a physical Blu-ray disc would. So he was like, obviously they have managed to go to like, like in Windows you have audio exclusive mode where you can say an app can take exclusive control of the audio output and that allows you to send the bitstream directly from the sources. Like there's no reason why the Xbox shouldn't be able to do the same thing. Uh, but then he just got another update like a couple of days ago and this is like a preview build, but it took that away. It all, oh, went, yes. it all went back to being, if you set it to Atmos, everything was Atmos. Oh, so sucks. Yeah. Right. Anyway, getting back to Plex, none of these can do it. His second question is actually about whether the Apple TV 4K might be able to do it in the future when it gets its tvOS 12 update in the fall and adds Atmos support. And as far as we know, I'll just answer that question now. As far right, as I, I have to get some water in, you get your water. I left my fan on, so it's All making right. noise. I don't want to have to get out of the signal. <laughs> so as far as we know right now, we, we can't confirm or deny. Uh, they have confirmed that it will work for iTunes content. We know that'll be the case. Uh, it's all but been confirmed that it'll work for Netflix streaming on the Apple TV 4K. But there's never been a word about lossless Atmos output. So far, all they've talked about would be the Dolby Digital Plus lossy version of Atmos that iTunes is using and that Netflix uses and Amazon Prime will be using and Vudu uses that as well. They all use the Dolby Digital Plus version of Atmos, which is lossy. So can't count on the Apple TV 4K doing it. Uh, the Roku 4 and the Amazon Fire TV. Uh, so you know, we just heard the Amazon Fire TV is capable of outputting at least Dolby Digital Plus version of Atmos, but it won't do the lossless version of Atmos with Plex. So what is the box that will output full lossless audio using Plex with MKV backups? And that is the NVIDIA Shield. Uh, the NVIDIA Shield really is your best streaming set-top box choice if you want to use Plex. Uh, not only that, it can be your Plex server. If you already have a Plex server, of course, you don't have to do that, but it can. But that that really is the one you want. You want the NVIDIA Shield if you're a Plex user and if you want lossless audio. And I was mistaken in thinking that a Raspberry Pi should be able to do it using the Plex Media Player, and they call it the Plex Media Player for embedded platforms, but there's one that's specifically for the Raspberry Pi. And since the Plex Media Player is able to output lossless audio when you're using it on a Windows PC, I thought, oh, it must work on the Raspberry Pi too, but no, it does not. Uh, <laughs> I was chatting with another user who's like, I thought this would work on a Raspberry Pi, and I was like, I thought it would work too, and he's like, it doesn't. And apparently <laughs> it's a hardware limitation of the Raspberry Pi's HDMI output. So, uh, NVIDIA It's so Shield. funny how often I see Raspberry Pis these days. Yeah. I mean, I, I walked into a car dealership and I was buying this car, and there was Raspberry Pis behind every... <laughs> monitor i don't even think they have real computers i think they hold one real computer and everything else is just raspberry pis everywhere it's kind of cool so did you finish that question i did all right bobby i believe this is a multi-step question here this, uh, this is a big just one. two no just two. okay once we get down one. to mike is the big big Mike's stuff a big but one. bobby okay. right now Bobby, Bobby is still in the finishing stages of his 12 by 12 enclosed theater that will sometimes be used as a guest room. He's had in mind the whole time that we get dual SVS PV1000 subwoofers in a 12 by 12 room. I don't know. But now he's wondering if he could potentially spend a whole lot less than 950 on dual subs. He found the Klipsch R10 SW on sale for only $175 each. Obviously, that low price is attractive. Plus, it's physically smaller and matches the look of his Klipsch speakers. Are dual PV1000s really worth $600 more? Yes. <laughs> can I? Is that done? Is gonna be done with that question? Now? <laughs> yes, well, I'm sure. Uh, we can I mean, it depends a on what's further, important. But that is the short answer. In, 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 we answered this question last week. I feel like uh, uh, well, very we, similarly. Yeah, when yeah. we were talking about the Dayton sub fifteen hundred last week, right. uh, and this is even more cut and dry. Oh, I mean, these subs are negative three down to thirty two hertz. That's right. I mean, they they are not getting 
anywhere near 20 hertz no. in a room i mean you might be able to because I, I don't necessarily disbelieve clips when they say negative 32 at, oh they're pretty uh, honest with their subs uh yeah. but you corner load this this bad boy and you're gonna get 28 29 yeah yeah something something in maybe. there it's, it's no. a good half an octave of the nicest deepest bass that is is just not there yeah it's and I, there. I to me you know like if you said can i go for the sb one 1000s mm. or the pb 1000s i'd be like well you know the room's kind of a little bit too big for them but if the option is the p sb 1000s or these guys <coughs> i'm sorry i had to Good sneeze out the evil um no i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely the sb 1000s sure but um, no difference are in also... price for the sb 1000s versus the pb 1000s right. so but they're smaller they're physically they're smaller physically smaller but... which i would go for if i were you mm. i would definitely go for a smaller sub in this room uh if you can now you, that SB 2000s would be even better, but you know, <laughs> uh, you know, buy one at a time, I suppose. Mm. Uh, now these clips are just are really, it, it, they are not. They say SW on the back, but it should just say W because they're basically a woofer. <laughs> they are not a sub woofer in any sense of the word. So. Yeah, I mean, if, if he had been asking about the sub 1500, it would have been the same answer that we gave Christian last week, right. which is that I mean, the sub 1500 we think is a terrific value. You know, yeah. two hundred dollars for a sub that can legitimately play down to about twenty three hertz. That's a fantastic value, but it does basically drop off a cliff below twenty three hertz, and it's actually physically bigger than the PB one thousand. <laughs> so we probably wouldn't really point you that way. You know, it it would give us pause to do that. Although the price savings are certainly there, and there is Dayton's sub twelve hundred, which gets twenty five hertz ish extension but you know it's only 150 bucks each so you can't complain too much about that now you might consider say hsu's vtf1 right right? which is less expensive you're down in the 400 hundred dollar price range so not as big a savings as this clip show the dayton's but a little bit less money um but you know hsu very very honest in their ratings and uh being one of these variable tuning frequency ones that they have if you leave both ports open, then they're like, yeah, this is a 32 hertz sub, <laughs> just like the Klipsch. But if you plug one of those ports and flip the switch to give it deeper extension, but less output, then it's pretty flat down to about 22 hertz. Still not right down to 20. I mean, that's what you're paying the extra money for in the PP1000 is to get right down to 20 hertz. Yeah. So you have to weigh that. How valuable is that versus the money you're spending? Because I can totally understand saying, I a thousand dollars, nine hundred and fifty dollars. That's a lot of money, and it is a yeah. lot of money. Yeah, I I, I too. And I mean, I I don't care if you go for the if you've already bought them and you're right. like, I, I think they sound great. Right. I don't care that because I and you like them and you're enjoying them. That's great. You're asking us why should you spend the extra money or is it worth the extra money? To us, it is. Right. To us, it is. And that's from and these experience are of having gone why. through all the stages until we got subwoofers that can yeah. really hit that 20 hertz. And we're like, oh, oh, I've been missing that this whole time. Yeah. And now that I have it, I don't want to give it up. That's right. So Bobby has resigned himself to a 92-inch screen size, but can't help wishing he could accommodate a larger 106-inch screen. But this room only being 12 feet long, most projectors can, simply cannot throw an image that, uh, that size from that close. Are there any lower-priced 4K projectors lower price 4k projectors with a short enough throw and a small enough chassis to fit within the length and throw a length of his room and throw of a 106 uh, inch image um are you sure <laughs> that you want 106 uh you know before we go through the whole process of finding a <laughs> projector a lot of times we get into these this number game of like oh well you know this one you know, it's a little bit bigger blah 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 you know what do you actually prefer in the image? Because this is something that's so easy to test and people have very strong feelings about. Mm. Like if you get too big of a screen, you are going to hate it. You're not going to be a lot like, of, oh, like, if, sort of yeah, okay. if you're having to move your eyes all the time or mm -hmm. even worse, having to actually tur turn your head to see the sides of your screen. That's I don't like doing that. I my like kids watch my these head alone and Minecraft watch. videos all the time. Yeah. And uh, the guy just he's fidgety. Mm. So when he when he's just sta when he's talking with his friends while they're all playing Minecraft, making jokes, which is part of why my kids watch watch it. Uh, he just sort of like you know, turns, you know, turns his character around and has him jump and has him, you know, just kind of like, you know, kind of go back and forth. And I'm like, because it's all first person. And I'm, I'm about ready to puke all over my, my home theater. <laughs> it is so bad. 
so it's it's disorienting and mm. it makes you nauseated uh, or feel nauseated and you may end up in that experience if you get a screen that's too big so before you decide hey i really do want this 106 inch screen what is your actual preferred you know a ratio to and we've talked about this before you go to a movie theater mm -hmm. you sit in a seat that you like when there's a nice bright scene on you count the number of tiles on the ceiling, if there are tiles on the ceiling. And they're between you, on. Between you and the screen, mm -hmm. and you, you're counting the number of tiles from one side of the screen to the other. And then that's that's what you like. That's your ratio. Mm -hmm. For the bottom of the screen, not the diagonal, the 106 diagonal, but the bottom of the screen. The width. The width and in, in 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 the distance from your eyes to the screen. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to know. Count that. If it ends up being close to 106 inches or un over 106 inches, within 106 inches for you. If it ends up being around 82, <laughs> then you get that 106 and you're going to hate. Ah. So make sure you do that test before yep. you decide, hey, I'm definitely getting this 106 inch screen. But let's say he does and he just wants a projector that can throw a bigger image when the entire length of his room is only 12 feet. Right. Uh, and he's like, he'd like to get a 4K if he could, but budget is a concern so he's like what are some in the in the lower price ranges so i don't know his exact budget but regardless i'm going to point you to an optima because they're yeah. the ones that have slightly shor shorter throws so the one that will for sure be able to throw a 106 inch image uh, uh given the length of his room is their least expensive one the optima uhd 50 uh, you can find okay. it for about thirteen hundred and fifty dollars. Retail price is fifteen hundred, but you can find it all over the place for about thirteen fifty. Uh, so it's one of the least expensive. That is the one that uses a ten eighty p resolution panel, but it wobbles it four times per frame to give you the full eight million pixels per frame uh, of four k resolution. Now, it's HDR compatible, but HDR really doesn't look any different from SDR in terms of the contrast or the light output. It is using the RGB cyan yellow color wheel so it really does not have the wide color so it's compatible with the hdr signals and that but it really doesn't show them to you and it doesn't have the greatest black levels and all of that is what makes it the least expensive one but it can certainly fit and give you the largest screen size it's got the shortest throw of these now the next two i'm going to mention they just barely fit so they're they're <laughs> the body of the chassis is 13 inches from front to back and then we're worried about how far is the lens to the screen. So assuming the screen is flush on your front wall, the UHD 60 and the UHD 65, both from Optima, they need 10 feet 9 inches from lens to screen to throw a 106 inch diagonal 16 by Dude, 9 image. you're going to have to have like a right angle HDMI cable. <laughs> yeah, because you're talking about 2 inches to spare. <laughs> but theoretically it's... it'll fit. <laughs> theoretically it'll fit it might be very very snug but i mean you're right very few other projectors will so the uhd 60 goes for about 1700 dollars. it's very much comparable to epson's uh home cinema 4000 except for the home cinema 4000 has like a powered zoom lens and all that stuff lens memories the uhd 60 doesn't have any of that it has a little bit of vertical manual vertical lens shift and nothing else so not as easy to set up but in terms of black levels similar in terms of how it performs with hdr similar but the uhd 60 does not have the wide color it is also using the rgb cy color wheel mm. and it doesn't really have the wide color the uhd 65 does have the wider color they're using an rgb rgb a red green blue red green blue six segment color wheel but it's twenty three hundred dollars meaning it's competing more with epson's home cinema 5040 ub and it doesn't get quite as black and it doesn't get quite as wide color as the epson but it does give you this throw range on the smaller chassis that might work but twenty three hundred dollars i'm thinking is probably more than he wanted to spend but that is the probably. one that gives you the nicer hdr and the better black levels and the wider colors so yeah all optimas pick your poison yeah nick Nick is still using his Pioneer Kuro Plasma TV. Got his money's worth out of that thing. But he's feeling the urge to upgrade to a 4K HDR display with full DCI P3 color. Right. He's in the basement with total light control. He can make it pitch black if he wants to. But he finds pitch blackness a bit fatiguing when watching his Kuro. So he uses some bias lighting, a single 40 watt incandescent lamp at the moment. Though he's considering stepping that down to 25 watt bulbs as he thinks uh, he might be missing a tiny bit of shadow detail with the 40 watt light. You can tell uh, what sort of viewer Nick is just yeah. from that Why statement. doesn't he get like the bias? Is the bias lane behind the TV? 
Or I'm, is he just I'm not it, like, exactly sure the where the placement. He, he just talked about the incandescent bulb he's using. It kind of sounds like he should be putting that like behind the TV so that it's yeah. You know, or it, if it I is think... already, maybe just put a shade over the 40 yeah. watt or that you're already yeah. using. Yep. Yeah. So the big question, OLED or flagship LCD with full array local dimming? Since he likes to, uh, to use a bias light, will the perfect black levels of an OLED even be noticeable? Dude, I'm going to just straight up tell, the, tell you right now, this dude is never going to be happy with an LCD. Nope. <laughs> Not, there is just zero chance. The question, it answers itself. Yeah. I have a Kuro. Will I will I even really notice those tiny little differences? The fact that you're even even worried about those tiny little black levels <laughs> means that you are gonna hate an LCD. Every, anytime yeah, it does yeah. anything weird, you're gonna be like, oh. I mean, the Tom number one thing I know is gonna bug you, Nick, if you went LCD, is you're gonna be watching movies on this thing. A lot yeah. of those movies have black bars, and on, uh. even on the Z9D, even on the Q9FN. Those black bars, they don't stay completely black all the time. There's a little bit of that. If you've got a bright object that's right up close to the black on bar, the line. yeah, bleeds into that black bar a little bit. The OLED, those black bars are as black as the bezel. You cannot tell the <laughs> difference between the screen and the bezel, and they stay that way. I'm like, that alone is enough for me to know Nick wants an OLED. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that I, the rest of the question even isn't even worth reading, to be honest with you, because <laughs> he's it, it, it's it's... There's just no way this guy's going to be happy with an LCD. It's, this is a pretty cut and dry. I will just, th this is the warning I'm giving everybody. Be aware. Uh, the LCDs have this too, but that little bit of vertical banding that you can see in the dark grays, they're all going to have some of it. You can't escape it entirely. It's inherent to the panels, but the LCDs have it too. And the LCDs often have some banding or dirty screen effect in the bright grays, which I actually think is even worse because that you see more often in content. Uh, but get it home. Put on a 10% gray, you know, you can just do it on YouTube or you can actually use the internal test pattern in its white balance setting in the LG OLEDs. You can go in there and turn on its internal test pattern and you can step all the way through from a 5% gray all the way up to 100% gray. Uh, but go by your first blush impression. If you're like, this is pretty good, you know, yes, if I examine it, I can see some vertical banding, but when my first blush is, that's pretty good. If you right away are like, hey, there's like two or three obvious bands, send that one back, exchange it. You got one of the 20% that isn't so great. Get one of the 80% that's pretty darn good. And that'll keep you happy. So he doesn't necessarily mind paying the higher price for L an OLED or a flagship LCD, but the 75-inch 2018... Okay, he's not going to want that. Uh, <laughs> Vizio P-Series available for 2100 which seems like a tempting combination of size and price. Can we convince him that a 65-inch OLED would be a better choice? Or, or that waiting and hoping on the price of a 77-inch OLED comes down to maybe five or $6,000 as a viable option. Um, let me tell you, how much is your time worth? Because mm. you're going to because you're gonna unbox this thing, you're going to set it up, and then you're going to put it back in the box, and you're going to take it back to the store. So <laughs> all of that time, how much is that time worth? I mean, because you're the, not going to want to keep it. For the majority of people, I completely agree. A 75-inch, really good 4K mm -hmm. HDR LCD for $2,100. I'm like, that is a compelling combination of price yeah. and size. But for sure Nick, is. from the, <laughs> nope, it's not, I'm sorry, Nick. It's not, you're, not, you're, you're gonna say it. Tom's right. You're, you're a video file, and that's fine. Yeah. Okay. But let's just call a spade a spade and say, you, sir, are only gonna be happy if you have something that is at least comparable in performance to your Kuro, and uh, LCD ain't it. So you're gonna <laughs> now have to the seventy-seven OLED. inch OLED. So they're nine thousand dollars right now. The C eight seventy-seven right. incher nine thousand dollars might uh, six thousand dollars when the replacement is coming out next year. Yeah, <sighs> maybe five thousand kind of iffy. But I mean, we've seen what used to be. So they used to have the G seven and the W seven, right? The wallpaper mm -hmm. one. Those used to be the ones that had seventy-seven inch sizes available, and we saw those go from fifteen thousand down to ten thousand. Now, That's I don't third. think you're going to see the same $5,000 drop, but we might see the similar percentage of about a yeah. third of the price. So $6,000, uh, not out of the question, uh, but you would have to wait for that. But the alternative is, if you're wall mounting it, you get one of those articulating mounts and you just kind of pull that 65-incher a bit closer to you. Or you yeah. nudge your seats a bit closer to the 65-incher and you can enjoy it right now. Yeah, Mike. Mike is a fairly new listener. This is this guy with all the questions, right? It is. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. He's, he's going to do his whole thing right now. <laughs> Mike is a fairly new listener. A friend turned him onto the podcast. Now he's hoping we can help him finalize some of his dedicated basement theater plans. The finished room will be fully enclosed, light-controlled, and soundproofed. 
He's been working with Ted White from the Soundproofing Company, and the primary concern is preventing sound from getting upstairs. A little bit of sound leak into the rest of the basement would be okay, but not if it leaks upstairs. Well, you can't tell it to stay downstairs. It's not yep. on your kids. The room will be 20 feet long, 13 feet uh, three inches wide, and uh, the finished ceiling would be eight feet six inches high. That's pretty big for a basement. Mm-hmm. And then there will be soffits in the grid in a grid pattern uh, below the finished ceiling, which will conceal a structural beam, the ducting for the dead air vent exchange system, and the theater sliding and Atmos speakers. So that's probably the six inches. So the finished. Uh, uh, well, the beam. He said so. the The beam itself isn't a foot deep but the soffit that will go around it will end up being about a foot so the the bottoms oh. of these soffits will be about seven i think he said seven feet seven inches right so they're, okay. they're like 11 inches from the finished right. ceiling okay. to the bottom of these soffits but he's putting in this sort of grid pattern um uh, on his ceiling so, so it's like uh, it's not a drop ceiling but it's sort of like a drop ceiling well, no these are soffits so okay you know look up at your ceiling and you would see a grid uh you know the, so the the soffit part of them will be at seven feet seven inches and then the ceiling above that will be eight feet six but the point is it's a continuous ceiling at that eight feet six and then all of the stuff for the room is concealed Inside within the these soffits below that finished ceiling so okay. that's the soundproofing part of it right he's able to put all of his Pot lights, his in ceiling Atmos speakers, his ductwork, and everything is within this already enclosed finished room, and then just covering that with soffits, which that's what you want to do if you want maximum yeah. soundproofing. So clearly, Ted White has had a large influence on the soundproofing plans. He's closing off this room from a larger section of his basement, so any pre existing walls will have sound clips and hat channels added to the existing studs. And he has planned for a double stud wall with double airlock style doors for the new partition wall. A dry wall, uh, the, I'm sorry, all dry wall will be double with green glue in between. For some reason, his wife really does not like that airlock style two doors idea. So he could start by installing a single solid core door, and if they discover that it's not enough, he could, they could add the second door later? Question mark. The double stud wall will have a doorway opening in, in it either way, so the framing for the second door could already be there if needed. So what are our thoughts on that? I mean, I sure. I mean, you could always get like a super duper cheap door to begin with, and then um, when it, <laughs> it when there's all kind of sound coming through that door yep. and then up the stairs, you're and your wife's like, "Ah, oh, it's so loud!" Then you're like, "Okay, honey, well, I told you, so let's go get the other door." And I then guess. get two good doors this time. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm so tempted to just say. I mean, it, uh, so the what double Ted- doors is so weird. It's just weird. <laughs> I agree with his wife. It's weird. Just get like one big heavy door uh, you know i guess i don't i mean what ted white recommends a lot of people would consider overkill and i can see yeah. where they're coming from but at the same time what he recommends will work right well right? i mean i understand that and i think he does too but yeah it's <laughs> weird okay it is well, weird so you to open have one do- door and there's another door right there's there. another door there it's like, like the you're guy a hotel who takes off the, guy who takes off the sunglasses and another pair of sunglasses yeah, underneath it's yeah. it's just odd i agree with his <laughs> wife here i do i i think it's weird i think you get I, I, this is what i say you do you make like a little like the little you know bigger frame like do not put the framing for the second door in yet okay just do the first door uh-huh. and it just has a thicker frame for some reason i've got like because this room that I'm in right now, they added a bathroom. They added this onto the house, which was right behind the garage, and they added a bath, took part of the garage space, and made a bathroom there. So the wall that is between me and the bathroom, mm-hmm. the, where I'm currently sitting, is actually cinder blocks. Okay. So it's huge. <laughs> so yeah. I have this, I have like this, like six inch, seven inch framing right okay if i have to walk through to get to my my bathroom door no one has ever said to me why is this like this hmm. but if they opened that door and they saw another door and there's another look door at, they would look at me like i'd lost my damn plus, mind plus you'd have uh uh acoustic insulation on that door to make sure that any echoes that right. between the two doors get damped yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. you'd want to do yeah I'd, i i know it looks weird but uh i'll well, tell you what if, if, <laughs> if, if can you get ted white to agree to like a pocket door for one of these doors so that like the door oh. on the you know on the inside or something like that that you can somehow uh. you can somehow hide it and, and it just it stays away <laughs> most of the time and then when, just when you're watching a movie you slide that one closed i mean i don't know dude this it's it's just weird 
honestly, my instinct is like, just fight the bullet and put it in the double doors and you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it before long at all. But um, I, I can... Uh, I don't I don't, uh, I don't agree. I don't know. I, I can't in, lie. In, in. I'm sorry. I can't lie. I'm, I'd, I would just do the double door. You're going to build the whole double drive, the double studs and everything already. And if you do end up needing the second door later, that means taking down a bit of the things so you can put in the casing for the door instead. It's a whole... It's a whole deal, and you're going to be stuck with the one door, and then a bit of sound's going to leak into the rest of your basement. It's going to get into your ducts, and it's going to bother your wife upstairs. I'm like, just put in the two doors. You're done. I don't know. Sorry, man. We disagree. We can see why you and your wife would disagree. We're yeah. no help on this one. I'm the wife, apparently, in this, right. in this argument. I get to be the wife. And I'm the guy with two pairs of sunglasses on. There you go. The plan is to have the first row of seats 12 feet back, uh, from the front wall, and the second row of seats two and a half feet from the back wall. With, 12, with his 12-foot viewing distance, he'd really like to have a 135-inch screen for a nearly 45-degree field of view. But that screen size would only leave him one and a half, uh, only one and a half feet on either side. So does that force his front, left, and right speakers to be too close to the side walls? So he sort of lay out the distances for someone's 20-foot long theater. Would 11 feet from the 120-inch screen be a better choice? He hadn't really considered how much space is behind the second row since he's uh, much more concerned about where this first row would be seen, uh, sitting. Okay, so he wants to be about 12 feet, which is fine. Oh, yeah. It's 20 foot long room, 12 feet is, is perfectly fine. Yep. Uh, a foot and a half on either side is really, really tight. It's snug. It's it's not like undoable. That, it's no. okay. It's, you, it's just You snug. can bring your speakers into the room that'll change the angles mm. so that you can, uh, you can cheat them in a little bit and they little won't be bit. hit by the projector. Yeah. But you will be awfully close to the side walls. Now, you put some absorption on those side walls, and it yeah. mitigates largely the acoustic problems. But uh, sometimes imaging becomes an issue, and some other things. So th there's a couple of solutions here: smaller screen, mm -hmm. uh, which then you can move your front row of seats from 12 feet away to like uh, 11 uh, feet away. <laughs> well, 11, or I mean, you can, if you really wanted to do this, you could actually because you don't want to be in the midpoint of the room. No. So you could go a little bit in front of the midpoint of the room, then your screen can be quite small mm. for that first row, and your second row could be at 12 or 13 feet. You know, and then you got all this space behind you. A whole bunch of space you. behind you. That seems like a waste. Yeah, which seems like a waste, but you know, so put the third row in there. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> Or you can uh, uh, use in-wall speakers or a, a, you know, build a false wall. Then that moves to any. If you use in wall speakers, you can have the whole front of the the front of the room be a screen if you wanted it to be, and right. then acoustically transparent screen. Which are actually and, some of his questions coming up. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you could do with that. Or the problem, and this is what we're, we're going to come up to when we do get come up to those. If you do build a false wall, then you're cutting off some of your space, which means your screen is going to be even closer to you. Which That's means right. The, your screen size will then be even smaller. That's right. Yeah. So, the, the one of the other options you can consider here is this: not having a fixed frame screen. Oh. Just get a motorized drop screen that f comes from the ceiling. Yeah. About two feet, three feet, you know, two feet into the room. Then you get the same field of view viewing angle with a smaller screen size and you just have speakers you walk into the room you see chairs and you see speakers and like people are like where is the screen and you go press the button hmm. and your screen comes down which would be awesome hide it in the soffit even better they'll be <laughs> like this is the sexiest thing i've ever seen i mean so, again my my inclination is i mean i laid out this 20 foot long theater for someone else and i was like yeah i would sit 11 feet from the front wall I'd use a 120 inch screen at that point. That gives you the 44 degree field of view, very similar. Then the second row of seats can be six feet behind that at 17 feet, leaving you three feet behind the second row, which is nice acoustically because then they're not right up against the surround right. back speakers. And I'm like, to me, that all just works. You are a little bit behind the midpoint of the room. So acoustically, that's okay for that front row. And the 120 inch screen is easier to light up. He wants a 4K HDR projector. The slightly right. smaller screen means you can reach the full 100 nits. Like it all just works. The math all just works works out yeah i'm like i i understand the but 135 it sounds like such an enticing size but i'm like it's the end experience that counts and now right. you've like you're not worried about your speakers being too close to side walls you've still got the field of view you've got better acoustics for your back row even though you don't care about that as much like it just it all works out and it's less expensive so what's not to like i don't know 
So yes, should he consider going with the even larger screen, but making it acoustically transparent so all of three of his front speakers can go behind that screen? Well, the, the downside and the real major downside that you should consider here is that you, you know, you're now looking at a projector that has to be able to put out enough light mm. to get that screen lit up. The bigger you get, the harder that is to do. 120 most projectors are built yep. out of the box to do 120 fairly handily yeah. you know uh, that is that is sort of the the sweet spot there so going much bigger than that 136 you know 150 mm. you're looking at a, having to pay more for a you know a specialized that's like high projector. lamp mode to get yeah. sdr yeah right, for at 150 yeah and plus if you went acoustically transparent either you're now going in wall speakers for your front speakers or you're building a false wall which means the screen is physically closer to you so you wouldn't go larger right you, you go smaller you probably go smaller exactly because the screen has which now moved closer to you is honestly a really is is a very good that i like better than Right. I mean, that's similar to your use a motorized one that's mounted right. a little bit physically closer to you. So then it's smaller and your speakers are away from the side walls again. Yeah, it's smaller. But I like the idea of the the false wall. You bring everything into room. You can get the, you know a nice, perfect screen size. that's fixed frame, acoustically transparent. You can put your speakers wherever the heck you want up there. Yeah. You can change your speakers out whenever you want. Uh, it gives you a lot more flexibility. It's a little bit more expensive in the construction part of it. Yep. But and in the, the end, acoustically transparent screen is a bit more expensive than just a right. white screen. But in the end, you'll end up, I think, you know, having a lot. It, it gives you a nice, clean look. It does now, do that. Yeah, I can't it, deny that. Uh, but there's so to me, there's something about the the distance from the screen thing, though. You know, now you're talking right. about being nine and a half feet away from your screen instead of eleven or twelve. Right. And it starts feeling like, yeah, I'm almost within flat panel territory now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, right. I don't know. It's tricky. If you had a considerably larger room, I'd be all for a false wall. But with 20 feet, I'm like, 20 feet in two rows, I like the 120-inch screen on the front wall. And then you just sit a little bit closer to it. Yeah. Almost all of his money is going to the construction of the room. So he he was planning on going with a silver ticket screen in order to keep the budget under control. If he does go with acoustically transparent, is a silver ticket woven screen still a good choice? Isn't it like we said 12 feet is Yeah, 10 feet you is want to be about sit? 12 feet away from it to not pretty much like never see the weave. Guaranteed not to see the weave. And it, yeah. you're, you're right in the somewhat questionable zone. <laughs> You yeah. know, you're going to be 11 or 12, maybe. If, it, if I you know go that... acoustically transparent with a false wall, you're maybe in the 10 or 9 and a half foot range. Right. At which point I'm like, I kind of want that Seymour mm. UHD fabric with the really tight weave. Way more money. Yeah. All right. So apparently he's never this. he has only recently been turned on this podcast because he doesn't know the fight he's about to start. But had it, here it goes. <laughs> he had it in mind to go with a 6 by uh, 9 aspect ratio screen. 16 by 9, sorry. But he isn't opposed to a 2.35 to 1 screen instead. Maybe a wider, acoustically transparent 2.35 <laughs> to 1 screen would be, look best. What do we think? <sighs> Rob's going to say both, and I don't. It's 16 <laughs> by 9. It's 16 to 9. That's what you want because you want it to... Uh, the, the, you don't want to have black bars yeah on the sides when you watch your 16 by 9 stuff it's going to make if you got the the correct size 6 uh, 2.35 to 1 uh -huh. then your regular movies are going to be tiny well like tv regular tv is yeah. going to be tiny well, well smaller. 16 by, it's not, well, i wouldn't say tiny it's going to be smaller the way it should be your movie should be wider than Shut your tv it. Yeah, but no, no that's no. not true. I don't, not why? True. Why would your television be larger than your Cinemascope movies? It that's doesn't matter. You're sitting in a room. You should have it as big as possible at all times. You don't make things purposely smaller. That's that's ridiculous. I, I tele television should be smaller than Cinemascope, ideally. But <laughs> the problem here is that you're going. Something has to be masked or have black bars. Something yeah. does right? You go with the 2.35 to 1 screen, then everything you watch that's 1.85 to 1 or 16 by 9 leaves blank on the sides of your screen. How are you going to deal with that? There are ways to deal with that. You could get a Seymour AV screen with masking panels that you stick up there with magnets. You could pay a whole boatload for motorized masking that comes in from the sides, or you could have motorized curtains that you use, but then you wouldn't want to put all your speakers behind all of that because the curtains are going to come in sometimes and block your front left, right? It opens up all these 
issues you have to deal with that blank space on the sides of your screen somehow whereas if you go the 16 by 9 screen when you're watching cinemascope well yeah you'll have black bars above and below but with the projector that he wants to get those black bars are really black mm -hmm. and i mean if you want to do masking again you have those options you can get motorized masking or the magnet type of masking if you go see more av um but honestly with the projector he wants on one of these jvcs the black bars are going to be really black. I'm in favor of going the 16 by 9. Now your IMAX looks bigger than your CinemaScope, and you're not dealing with masking. Right. So you're strongly leaning towards a JVC X790 projector. Where would we recommend mounting it, keeping in mind that the ceiling support beam cannot be moved, so the usable height of the ceiling is only uh, the bottom of that beam, about 7.5 feet. Any particular projector mounts we'd recommend? Most of the time we recommend projector mounts from Monoprice because they're cheap and they work. For a JVC, though, <laughs> yeah. those are big and heavy. Are they? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, just if for future reference, whenever you're, you know, if other people, you know, like, oh, I should ask them what I should do. Uh, Projector Central has a calculator. You know, you put your they do. screen, you put your uh, screen size and the projector you want, and they'll tell you where you can mount it. What's the available range? And since the JVCs have tons of zoom range and tons yeah. of lens shift range, I would suggest. You put this on a shelf on your back wall. <laughs> yeah, that's easy. I would totally that's suggest that too. you don't have to worry about a mount at that point. You don't even have to put the thing upside down. It's got enough lens shift. It can be right side up, high up on a shelf on your back wall, and still completely fill your screen. It's got tons of lens shift and tons of zoom range. And the lens of the thing, so it's uh, it's over a foot from front to back. It's like almost a foot and a half right. from front to back. So... Even at the back of your room, it's going to be like 18 and a half feet, or actually probably a little less than 18 and a half feet from the lens to the screen. Totally within the zoom range for either size. You could do 120 or 135, whatever you decide to do. And that's with the screen on your front wall. Uh, but if you go with 120 inch size and you have it that far back, it still can get you to the full HDR 30 foot Lamberts, 31, 32 foot Lamberts. It all works really nicely. And having it on that back wall, now you're never worrying about it being directly overhead. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Yep. I like that. So he, again, he's got not a ton of money in the budget for new gear. So while he plans to upgrade his speakers, eventually for the time being, he'd like to use what he already owns. He's got a Denon X6400H receiver that can power 11 speakers all on its own. It runs hot, though, so that has him a little bit concerned. It should be okay, though, right? <laughs> yeah, it should be okay. I mean, if you're really that concerned, then get a you know cheap ish two channel amp to take the load of your front two speakers sure yeah or uh, uh, that will that will do the most to dissipate the you know that heat that's yeah. coming off there is from the amps you know being used and your front left and right speakers get the most usage mm -hmm. so you could buy a two channel amp and that would uh extend the life of your receiver if that's uh if you're really worried about the heat. And if it's running hot like that, I would just double check that the video processing in the X6400 is right, actually turned right. completely off because those video processing chips actually get really hot. Really hot. Those are the ones that can sometimes yeah. give you the biggest problems. So, yeah. So he has one SVS SB2000 subwoofer already. He's, he was thinking he'd just add a second uh, SB2000. He talked with SVS and they said that it's approximately 2200 cubic feet. The sealed sh sub should be fine, although the ported models could work too. Is he, he going to regret sticking with sealed subs? Should he stretch <laughs> the budget to get the dual PB2000s instead? No. <laughs> yeah, 2200 cubic feet, and these are SB2000s, not SB1000s. Yeah. yeah. A dual SB2000s in 2200 cubic feet? I'm like, you're, you're good to go. Yeah. You're good to it, go. It, I'll be honest with you, I don't even think you're going to notice a perform that big of a performance jump if you went to the PB2000s. I mean, they mm. do hit lower, but I don't know that you're going to notice. It's all subsonic anyways. <laughs> so I don't know how much you're going to actually notice of the, of the difference. So I would just definitely save the money. Just keep what you've got. Yep. Buy its brother or sister mm -hmm. or whatever it is. And then uh, you're off to the races. Easier to place, too. Physically smaller. Yeah. yeah. And, and space is... I know you have feel like you have a lot of it, but it's still at a premium in these situations. So for the Atmos speakers, he already has four Sonus 6.5 inch in ceiling speakers that he plans to install in the soffits on the ceiling uh, theater ceiling. He used them in a previous room as uh, an all in ceiling 5.1 setup that he thought sounded not that bad. So he's not really all that excited about them, but they'd be fine for Atmos, right? Yep. Oh yes. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Atmos. Yeah. Yes. Done. <laughs> nice that you have soffits to put them in too. Yeah. 
good stuff. He likes SVS's speakers, and he plans to upgrade to them eventually, but for now, he'll use the Boston Acoustics VR2 and VRC that he owns as his LCRs. For surrounds, for left, center, right, that's what LCR stands for. Mm -hmm. For surround speaker, he already owns some ELAC debut B6 bookshelf speakers, but he's found that they're quite directional, and while they have a nice sound on their own, they really don't match his Boston Acoustics. While ELAC speakers are just sitting in the box right now, so sh should he install them, or should he sell them now and get a uh, right now and get SVS bookshelf speakers as it surrounds and surround backs since he wants to end up with SVS speakers in the end anyways why do you want to end up with SVS I mean I like SVS speakers yeah don't get me wrong and I don't think they're a bad choice but are you just liking them because you like their subs because I don't know that <laughs> do you have some experience with SVS speakers that you have I mean he said in his us? email clearly that he likes their speakers and he knows which SVS speakers he wants to get and right. I have no reason to tell you to oh, go away from that because they're good speakers so so yeah. the elac speakers are quite directional yeah that's what he found it's not impossible well, they do have a waveguide on that tweeter so i know but i'm wondering what situation he used these things if he had an mm. all-in ceiling 5.1 system and added yeah he was ELAC saying this was speakers. more like a near field type of setup that he was uh, using the, okay. the elacs in i don't know I, if it were me because i mean he's SVS doesn't have on walls, right? Or in wall speakers? Mm, or other than that. the prime satellites and prime elevations, they don't yeah, really have no. on walls, no. I, I I would go ahead and just try these ELACs, to be honest with mm. you, because the wiring is not going to be in the, the mounting is not going to be that much different than no. whatever he's going to yeah, get. Yeah, I mean, the, the B6s are, are the larger of the bookshelf ELAC models. So you probably want to get the uh, wall mounts that have the side clamping type of yeah. thing because they don't really have like a, a wall mount screw for them or anything like that built in so you'd want to get like the side clamping ones which those side clamping mounts will work just as well for any of the svs bookshelf speakers so, so what you end up doing in the end here is just setting up the elax yep. living with them yep. for a little bit and then if you're like nah hate them yep then do you go ahead and order the svs yeah yeah I and mean, if you go go with those side clamping mounts it won't be a difficult swap out Right, it's just the speaker cable and the yeah. yeah. I, that's that's my suggestion. Okay. Well, is that yep. also your suggestion? I'm in agreement. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Again, for someone else's 20, two, 20 foot uh, theater, we suggested two pairs of side surround speakers so that each row of seats gets has its own pair of side surrounds. But wouldn't having two speakers on each side sort of mess up the experience? Yeah, that's why we suggested it because we like messing stuff up so much. <laughs> nah, it'll be fine. Go, go to any commercial go movie to theater, any movie theater and, and look lots up. of sides around there's speakers, speakers all over the place yeah. it's supposed to be diffuse so he's much less concerned about the back row and there are also bulk bulkheads towards the back uh of the room to house his dead vet system to serve as an and, and to serve as an equipment closet so he'd probably have to use in wall speakers if he wants to give the back row its own side surrounds is it okay to just have one pair of surrounds uh that was his point all along he's still leaning towards that yeah i don't care <laughs> I mean, if your back row care. is for the occasional time that you have that right. many people and you are I don't, always I in the front row, yeah. yeah. One pair of side surrounds is absolutely fine. I have two rows of seats and my second row of seats is on the, it's not even a row, it is a love seat yep. and a single chair off to the side. I forgot about that one because did I get rid of that? I need to get rid of that. Anyhow, uh, there's like a little love seat back there that, that now that we have a five seater couch that we can mm -hmm. all sit on. We never, no one ever uses it. In fact, my son, my 15 year old, he's 15 now. My 15 year old son will sometimes try to go back there so that he can be by himself and mm -hmm. not be with the family. We're like, nah, you got to be up here with us. We're all sitting together. <laughs> so, and I'll tell you, the, the back row gets terrible surround experience. There you go. It's awful. But who cares? No one sits back there, anyways. <laughs> and this, yours won't be awful. We're leaving you some space behind that second row. So it won't yeah. be awful. It just won't be optimal. Yeah. But, yeah, that's fine. Totally fine to do what you want to do there. So it'll be a 7.2.4 setup, but should he run wires for any other speaker positions just in case he wants to use them in the future? If these soffits are not going to be easy to open, like you actually have to put holes yeah. in them to run more wires, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Wire for all uh, 10 overhead possible positions because <laughs> speaker wire does not have to be expensive. Wire right. for front wides, why the heck not? Wire for three pairs of side surrounds on each side, why the heck not? Because yeah. <laughs> you're, you're building a soundproof room and you do not want to punch holes in these walls in the future. Anything that even crosses your mind as a possibility for speaker wire, since speaker wire is not expensive, go ahead and run that before the walls are finished. Yeah. 
So he's going to have his AV rack in a bulkhead nook towards the back of the room. But he wants to keep his Xbox One X more accessible, so he's got a second space closer to his seat for any sources uh, source devices that use physical media. The layout means he'll need a long HDMI run going from those physical media sources back to his AV rack, and a second long HDMI run going from his AV rack back to his projector. Since it would all be running overhead in the sockets, he figured on the 50 foot length uh, for each HDMI run. <laughs> He's used an HDMI to Ethernet adapter before with good results, but that was with uh, 1480p. Mm -hmm. He knows he could run Conduit, but running Cat 6 would be a lot easier and cheaper for him. So, is there a good 4K Ethernet solution? And what do we think? Uh, what do we think he should use? I think you should put all of your gear right next to each other. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> I think that this is a very silly problem that you have created oh. for yourself. That's yeah. what I think. I, I see where he's coming. I mean, this is a this is a like a theater. He's like building a theater. Right. So, ideas in mind. I want to make them happen. You can make them happen. Tom has a point in that. You, if you're willing to change some plans, there might be a way to avoid at least one of these. You're going to need the one long run from the AV rack up to the projector, though. That's going to happen. Yeah, but it, it's at the back of the room, yeah. right? Yeah. And you said put the projector, put the projector on a shelf, yeah, on the shelf right. at the back yeah. of the room. So we, we, he's now got one and HDMI what, cable. Yeah, what probably if there were like one cable visible? Six foot long. That you're. Six Unless you're turning around from your front row to look at the back row all the time, yeah. No, yeah, yeah even I that. I mean, there's one six foot cable that you have to run in a wall. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. this is a this is a non issue. And honestly, you put how, how often are you switching discs? I mean, are you switching discs like all the time? Maybe. Not if you're watching movies. Not if it's a theater. You, you can just watch a two-hour movie, and then you're going to go switch a disc. And you know what happens when you switch a disc? Everybody leaves to go to the bathroom. Mm. See? No one sees what you do back there. All right, so that can be our number one, but let's just answer as asked, is there a solution in case he needs the long run? So there is an HD base T solution. That's right. the thing that turns right, right. HDMI into Ethernet. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Emotiva is now offering one for $400, that is the full 18 gigabits per second, fully like tested for HDCP 2.2 and all the HDMI 2.0 features. So $400 is the is the package that gives you the one that turns the original HDMI into Ethernet and then turns the Ethernet back into HDMI at your projector. So it certainly can be done. And yes, the Cat6 cabling is cheap, but uh, let's say it is even 50 feet. If you want one that we know is going to be guaranteed to work, Blue Jeans Cable is now selling active HDMI cables. Their 50 foot length is $85. So, I mean, with the Emotiva solution, if you needed two 50 foot runs, you'd need two of those $400 converters. That's $800 <laughs> to get this 100 feet of HDMI cable run, or, you know, 85 times two, <laughs> 170 right. bucks uh, for active HDMI cables. But he now, doesn't need two, anyways, he just needs one. But he might. Right. If he does exactly what he's saying, he's thinking he'll need two 50-foot runs. Why would he need two? Because I thought one the, of it was... The one to go from the sources, up the wall, through the soffits, over to his AV rack, and then the one right. to go from his AV rack over to his projector. Yeah, but his projector's going to be right overhead. I it's know. not going to be 50 I, feet. I don't know. I'm, I'm just answering it in case it is. In case it is. It's not going to be 50 feet. It's going to be like a, yeah. 10 at max. It's a 7-foot high room. <laughs> Where is he going to do with the other with the other? Yeah, I, I'm sure feet he was thinking cable. of that before, and I'm not sure why it would need to be 50 feet from somewhere towards 50 the back. Feet, of the room to go the all the way around the whole room back again, I, man. Maybe I don't know. Maybe the way the the like where there's actually holes in these soffits. That's just I don't know. I'm answering as is. I'm just saying you all could right, use fine, active whatever. HDMI. Yes. Mono Price does have their Dynamic View HDMI cables. Their 50 foot length is only 65 dollars, but not a big difference between them and Blue Jeans. Both of those should work, but. He is thinking, okay, in the future, there might be HDMI 2.1. We might have the 48 gigabits per second. Active HDMI cables would need to be changed wholesale in order right. to make that work. And then which you're like, okay. Which is great because your projector is going to be directly above your gear, which means that if you do, you, if you do have to switch out cables, it's not going to be a long run. Yeah. And it'll be, uh, and, and you have a greater chance of your current cable being okay with the next thing that but comes if it's out. But if it's active, it won't be. Because that's right. active all depends on the chipsets and the, the, that's band, right. that's right. the bandwidth that's right. can't go any higher. So it would that's be like conduit that you'd want to use with any of the active HDMI cable solutions. But we have no idea what kind of Ethernet you, you might need for 48 gigabits per second. That might be four Cat7 cables that you need to run to carry that. We right. don't know. 
So, right. I mean, if you want to go insanely overboard on wiring your Ethernet ahead of time, I guess you could do that, but it's still $400 per HD base T, you know, converter uh, or a converter pair. Yeah. So, I'm in favor of going with the active HDMI cables and running them in conduit. It's what I'd do. Uh, yeah, I'd go with the, well, Okay. Moving everything yeah. closer so you don't even need active HDMI to begin with. That's yeah. that's Tom's that's, suggestion. That's my suggestion. That's right. <laughs> Whether we suggest for controlling all of this, you'd like to be able to control things from outside the room as possible. The Harmony remotes are the answer, unless you want to go with something, you know, custom. Yeah, would... the, the well, first of all, the Denon, you could control directly with Denon's smartphone yeah. app. Yeah. Uh, so as long as you have your Denon connected to your uh, network, your home network, and then your smartphone connected to that same home network, you could control the AV receiver directly with the Denon, uh, the, just, just the, <coughs> excuse me, the Denon app. Uh, but yeah, the Harmony Hub can also connect to your network and can right. be controlled by the Harmony app for your smartphone. Right. So you can control everything via your network. Now, if you're building these super thick double stud, double drywall, clip and hat channel walls, there's a chance that your wireless Wi-Fi router might not penetrate all of that with the strongest signal. I wouldn't think so. You better run Ethernet from your router. Run some Ethernet from yeah. your main router into that room, and then you can have a, a bridge, right? You can have a yeah. wireless bridge inside. Now you can yeah. plug the Harmony hub and your AV receiver right into that bridge which is then hardwired to your main router then anywhere you that you can do access that anyways though if you're going to be yeah. doing any streaming at oh, all yeah. and we know you... he's good with running ethernet apparently it's his favorite cable so yeah just just make sure you got a bridge inside of your theater connect everything to that now everything's on the network harmony hub is and and the uh, harmony app on your smartphone can do this from right. any room that you can connect to your network from yeah now, I mean, I did say that you know you could go with something more high end or whatever, but it oh, sure. involves a, a custom installer, and that's going to be a lot more money. Now, the, the upside to all that is that you know you're going to get, you know, it's going to be more a lot more expensive, but you're going to get you know, very precise control of everything and you know customization options up the wazoo. You know, they're going to be able to you know help you wire your lights all all up and have everything working together. You know, you're at, you know they'll have custom little icons for your on whatever touchscreen thingy they give you or app they give you. But it's really not necessary because the <laughs> Harmony Hub is ridiculously powerful. I mean, this yep. thing right here, this thing right now it does most of what people were paying tens of thousands of dollars yeah. for 10 years ago. And, and the hub has two extender outputs. Right. Um, so it comes with two little mini IR blasters. So like if you have this second place where your physical media sources are separate from the rest of your AV rack, you can just run a simple mono 3.5 millimeter extension cable that plugs yeah. into the hub and then extends one of these mini IR blasters to reach over to those other sources. You can totally yeah. do it all with the Harmony Hub. I, I know we're kind of done with this guy's question, yep. but one thing I wanted to say is I'm kind of, I, I guess, kind of concerned, but I'm kind of curious as to why he's decided to keep all of his gear in the room with him. Because oh. cause it seems to me... Well, now, he this, said there's kind of a convenient place because the way the house was built, there's like a fireplace upstairs, but not downstairs, but there's still like a gap below where the fireplace no, would I be. No, I understand. But yeah. I, I don't understand why he's not putting all of this stuff outside uh, of the theater now that would mm. uh, that now this would make me say okay there there now you need to have your sources for your physical media in the room with you right but why not put them outside the soundproofed room so that the sound of all this stuff isn't in the mm. room with you i mean mm. you're doing all this work to and make you're not stuff. concerned about the heat coming off of anything yeah. at all yeah i mean I, if, if it were me i would put it all put all of this garbage into a closet <laughs> someplace else and then you're then here we go with our 50 foot cables all right now right, you suddenly right. actually do need a 50 foot cable or two to go into your your room or whatever um i would still leave my source device with the physical discs in that closet, wherever it was, and just leave <laughs> just the walk theater over to, go to it. Okay. To it, I would still do that. But I, I, I be honest with you, I would take everything out of here. Just, first of all, I mean, I know that there's a little space back there that it'll be open or something if you don't put your your gear in it. But you know, I don't know, put like a little bar back there or something. <laughs> you know, that's better than than this. I mean, it, Maybe. this is just a, a noise and heat machine that you mm. don't need in your own theater. Okay. That's just me. Chad, 
Chad, oh, this is the question I should uh, going to use to go fill up my water cup that I've already emptied. Chad would like to start backing up his Ultra HD Blu-ray discs so he can play them as MKVs using Plex. He wants to keep the full lossless audio and Atmos and DTS and all that, and DTS X and all that stuff. But for now, his display is 1080p and st standard dynamic range. So, what's the best way to retain the lossless audio feedback? but down convert the 4K HDR video to 1080p SDR. Could the Apple TV 4K do all of that or will he end up with washed out colors? He supposes he could make 1080p MKVs, but then what, what is handling the SDR, I mean HDR to SDR conversion? Plus he really doesn't want to back up all his discs twice since <laughs> he does plan to get a 4K HDR display eventually. Yep. I don't know. Well, again, the lossless audio situation, uh, no difference there. I'm still going to be recommending an NVIDIA Shield to you. I know the NVIDIA Shield can absolutely convert the 4K down to 1080p. It can change the HDR to SDR. It, at least when I tested over at Paul McDonald's place, since he has a 1080p TV and an NVIDIA Shield, right. uh, the way it converts HDR to SDR, um, I overall prefer in that it retains all the detail in the highlights but it does so at the expense of the black level being a bit too high so what should mm. be black kind of looks gray now you can fix that in your display by simply lowering your brightness setting so it's as simple as maybe setting up two uh picture modes Right. One for regular SDR content and one for content that started as HDR but then was converted down to SDR by the NVIDIA Shield. It's not that hard to switch between two picture modes, in my opinion. So you sure. set one where the brightness has been set lower for the stuff you know was HDR but gets converted down to SDR. That keeps everything looking correct. And it's not, I mean, you literally just lower the brightness setting until the blacks look correct again. So uh, not the end of the world. Use two picture modes, but NVIDIA Shield is the way to do this. Right. Yeah, so on my Sony uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray player, uh, some of the special effects I've noticed, like a sp like the dinosaurs in mm -hmm. particular, uh, but some of the other ones too, you can see where I think the HDR to SD co uh, SDR conversion has not been perfect, and it yep. seems like there, it, like the entire thing is sort of washed out, yep, and it's extra fake looking. Like yeah. the, the, the yeah. special effects where you're like, the, I remember, like the kids are like, those dinosaurs don't look very good. I'm like, they look awesome. I don't know why they look kind of retarded <laughs> right now, but they no, look awesome. It's tough. You know, if something was mastered at 4,000 nits right. or, or heaven forbid, they just left the metadata at 10,000 nits, uh, you right. know, trying to convert all that down, down to SDR, it is a challenge. So yeah. it's not going to look perfect, but I like overall the way the NVIDIA Shield handles it by It does at least really wake me when they get a, an HDR display. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With you. Oh, yeah, it will. It really yeah. does. You'll end up with one sooner than you might have thought. <laughs> no, I won't. Alvin. Alvin has started backing up his... Oh, it's the same question. DVD collection to, onto his But PC. his actual he's, DVDs this time, all the I way know. before Blu-rays. DVDs. He's been, he's been using Handbrake. Mm. So what should his settings be if, uh, if his goal is to retain full quality? Not using Dude, Handbrake. I, <laughs> I haven't used Handbrake in forever. Uh, I did not open this. I should have opened it and looked at what my settings were. But ah. uh, it gave you. It gave you. I remember like it. It asked you on uh, the, the like the quality, like what you were using it on, like an iPad. Oh, okay. Or something yeah, like yeah. Because I mean, Handbrake is a full-on transcoder. Yeah. So it's taking it the original and then forever. compressing it into a different codec entirely. <laughs> It goes straight up. It's like almost one to one time conversions. <laughs> like it yeah. takes it. It takes it forever. So I imagine there's something on there that's like full or whatever. But sure. You know, but I would. I just use Make MKV, Alvin. I would just use Make MKV. It's so much easier. There's really no settings to toy with other than putting check marks next to the uh, audio ones that you want to keep. Right, which right. in DVD's case, there's really not much. Like, Dolby Digital 5.1. There's right. my audio. It's probably got a check mark next to it already. On Blu-ray, <laughs> it by default, it doesn't put a check mark next to the lossless audio. So you always have to go in there and put a check mark next to the lossless audio uh, if you're backing up Blu-rays with Make MKV. But for DVDs, it's it's nearly automatic, and there's nothing to futz around with. The results are fantastic. And in case you were thinking Make MKV costs money, um, it's perpetually in beta. <laughs> I mean, this, it's been around for like a decade now. Say, at least, yeah, it seems that way. It never come out of beta, and they always say, while it's in beta, you can use it for free. Now, you do have to go to their forum, and you go into the thing that says, make MKV is free while in beta, and they have a little code in there that you punch in as your activation code, and you get a new one every month. 
So it's a slight hassle to use it for free. You can pay them some money and never get that thing bugging you ever again. And honestly, I think Make M MKV is worth it. But in case you were thinking I'm using Handbrake because it's free and I'm worried that Make MKV costs money, it doesn't have to. And Make MKV is much simpler for all this. Uh, so which audio code actually you select for the backup process? Uh, I mean, Dolby Digital 5.1 in Make MKV <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for right. DVDs anyway. Or, or it might be DTS. It might be DTS ES 6.1 and you can back that up too. So he installed Plex, but he hasn't really been using it. His PC is connected directly to his home theater, so he's just been playing the backups directly with VLC. Mm -hmm. Any real reason to transition to using Plex all the time instead? Mm -hmm. Well, I imagine that there's uh, some interface bonuses. For and plus, sure. Yeah, you, you get know, all the nice uh, cover art, and it tells you the actors and the director, and it pulls in Rotten Tomatoes ratings and does uh, all those things. So, yeah, that's what I would do. But also... Yeah, yeah. You then get to use the Plex Media Player, which makes outputting that audio in its regular bitstream format so easy. Mm -hmm. Makes it so easy. So Plex Media Player. Next question. It really is. <laughs> yeah. So he says, "What should the settings be for his PC sounds card?" If should... you use Plex Media Player, you don't have to do anything. Uh, oh, yeah. Within the Plex Media Player, you will go into the Plex Media Player's settings, and you will tell it, "My AV receiver can understand Dolby Digital DTS, Dolby True HD." DTS HD master audio, and then it will just bitstream out the original audio exactly like it came off the disc. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. On to Eduardo. Eduardo got an SVS PB1000 two years ago. His wife didn't like it at first, but over time, she's gotten gotten used to the giant box, and he managed to upgrade <laughs> his speakers to Kef Q700 fronts and Focal Sib. It's Focal Sib surrounds? I don't know. If those are yeah, right. that's uh, just a model of speakers that they have. Yeah. yeah. So he's been really happy with the sound of the system until he saw Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom in a Dolby cinema. Now he needs more bass. Mm. Right. Sounds like mm. you're sitting in a null. But okay. Mm. He's got an open room. It's 12 uh, by 28 by 8 and a half. It's a living room, but it's open to the kitchen hallway. So it's an infinity square cubic feet. Yeah. Anyways, also, there's only truly one spot in the corner next to his couch where the subwoofer can live. Dual subs are completely out of the question. He has tried. It is definitely not going to happen. <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, there you go. All right, okay. What's this guy's name? Eduardo. Eduardo. Yes. All right, that, his wife's name starts with K. All right, so here we go. We're looking at these pictures here. Uh -huh. He has he's sitting directly on the back wall. There is a balcony. Yep. Slave glass left. door to his left. There is a big TV directly in front of him, mm -hmm. and so he's sitting on like uh, his theater space. He's sitting on the long wall, basically, is what it looks like right. here. And, uh, and then, to yeah, the right his... is the kitchen. Yeah. And then that goes on for nearly ever. Okay. <laughs> so I see he, he's got his subwoofer right next to the couch. Yeah. Uh, in the rear left corner, right next to that door or whatever. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah. Right, right next to the door out to the patio. Okay. So 20 foot, a 24 inch tall, 21 inch wide, and 30 inch deep box can squeak into that spot but nothing larger. And he's willing to spend upwards of $1,500. So which big subwoofer will give him the base he's looking for? Dude, I know you said that no larger, but if you can go to 21, two inches wide, uh -huh. you can get almost everything at Power Sound Audio. Okay? Oh, I see. Okay. Because <laughs> it, it's the, the, the tall is fine. Uh -huh. The 30 is great. N yes. nothing's, nothing's, nothing's deeper than 30. That, that's over there. But a lot of it is 22 inches wide. Okay. So if you can go to 20, I mean, 22 inches wide. <laughs> that's, cause it, that's pushing your sofa over one inch. One measly inch. Okay. And you can get stuff from Power Sound Audio, like their vent, their downward vented sub thing for like fifteen hundred bucks or fourteen hundred bucks mm. or whatever this fits in that. I'm gonna look it up real quick while you tell him what you think. Right, I, I was thinking I'd save him a bit of money because I've got a whole second answer to this whole thing. Okay, um, but I was thinking I'd save him a bit Dual of money subs. and send him to HSU. <laughs> Because, uh, no, not quite. <laughs> HSU, uh, you get uh, so their their big guy, the VTF fifteen H Mark II. Uh, would just just fit into these dimensions. I mean, it's a, it's a little over 18 inches wide. It is 24 inches tall. It's like 20, what is it, 28 inches deep, something like that. But it just squeaks in there. Uh, with the shipping price included, the VTF 15H Mark II is $1,032 right now. So fits within his budget. Uh, but they also have the slightly smaller, it uses the same driver, uses the same amp. It's just an ever so slightly smaller enclosure for the VTF 3 Mark V HP. And that's $895 shipping included. So about 
a hundred and not quite a hundred and fifty dollars difference in price. Uh, but those, I mean, stonking output, lots and lots of output coming out of those things. They fit the size, they fit the budget. But the whole second part of my answer is you said what convinced you that you want more bass than your PB1000 is producing is that you went to a Dolby Cinema. And as we discussed with Lee Overstreet, Dolby Cinemas use butt kicker tactile transducers. Hmm. And I am willing to wager that's what you experienced. Where that like, could be, I yeah. am feeling this bass like I've never felt it before, but that's because there was actually a big lead weight underneath your seat, physically shaking your chair. Yeah. Um, and I... now you can recreate that at home because you can buy butt kickers that work at home. And I do recommend the butt kicker brand ones. They're the ones I like. The The other bass shaking type units really are just a voice coil with a weight on them. Whereas mm. the butt kickers are like a lead weight suspended in a magnetic field. And they work just like a big fat piston to move mm. stuff. Um, so there are the $90 butt kicker mini LFE units, 90 bucks each. And you basically want one of those per seat, but he's got this sofa Right. So they have a unit for $200, really not bad. It's actually cheaper than if you put like three butt kicker minis uh, into a three-seater sofa. Instead, you get one butt kicker advance for $200, and that is meant for a sofa. It's the exact right thing for a sofa. They do have their even larger $400 butt kicker LFE, but that is meant to shake your entire subfloor. <laughs> you, you don't need it for a couch. It, it, like literally, it, they say to attach it to the structure of your house. To move that. Yeah, you don't need that. That so, seems excessive. I'd recommend the Bucky Rick Advance. It's 200 bucks. Uh, now, you want a nice amplifier to power that. You want about 400 watts, four or 500 watts to power that Buck Kicker Advance. I really like the Dayton Audio SA1000 amplifier. That's $400 itself. Uh, so but then if you. 600 bucks. Yeah, but then if you also wanted to power the other seat that you have in there or something like that, you have that option. You can run all of that off of the Dayton Audio SA-1000. Um, now, the last part of setting up the butt kicker, we talked about this with Lee, but but it's worth repeating. Um, some people have reported, hey, I've hooked up a butt kicker and the thing like bottomed out on me or it like, it like clanged at certain frequencies and stuff. I'm like, well, that's because what most people do is they just take their regular subwoofer output, which they have EQ'd for their subwoofer, and they split that with a Y splitter and feed it to the butt kicker. Right, But now the butt kicker is also being EQ'd and it doesn't need to be EQ'd. <laughs> it's not producing sound waves. It's just moving to the signal. So you really want to send a non-EQ'd signal out of your AV receiver, which unfortunately then means how do you get back to EQing your actual subwoofer? And for that, I'd recommend a mini DSP for $100 on top of that. So if you got the amp I'm recommending, the butt kicker advance and a mini DSP, you'd be spending $700 on that. Right. If you then got the HSU VTF3 Mark V HP, which honestly you might not even need because the PB1000 is probably giving you all the audible bass that you need. Sure. It's just not giving you the physical feeling that you got in a Dolby Cinema, which was being created by a butt kicker, butt kicker tactile transducer. So $700 could get you everything you need to recreate the Dolby Cinema, and you can still hear down to 20 hertz what your PB1000 is producing. But if you still want to upgrade your sub, you could get that VTF3 Mark V HP. I've put you $100 over your $1,500 budget, but you got you got this crazy huge sub and butt kicker. How much is that sub? Uh, 895 shipped for the VTF3 Mark V HP. So if you can get an extra inch <laughs> out, of okay. that, out of that little space right there, you can put uh, the Power Sound Audio V1510DF. Okay. Okay, that's $1,000, 999.99. It's frequency response with negative three is 18 hertz, but in-room yeah. extension, they're saying down to f maybe 14. It could happen. And, and it's got a lot of output. In that corner, it's you're going to shove to the corner anyways. You're probably going to get pretty close to that 14. It's 79 pounds. It is, <laughs> it is uh, 22 inches deep, 17.25 inches wide, and 23 inches tall. Oh, that's kind of small for them. Yeah. So it's it's, it's a down firing sub, so that's yeah. why it, it, it does this. But it's the twenty two that you got to you gotta get that extra inch in there. Right. But it's a down firing sub, so you can orient it in any direction that you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh all right. That's my suggestion. Okay. Uh, I lost my question, so let's go back over here. <laughs> 
Right. So if he gets the HSU VTF 15H Mark II, would it, it would be one inch taller than the dimensions he gave if he installs the feet, but the actual box all by itself would just fit. Are the feet mandatory or could he leave them off? You can. You can't. I, I want to put a <laughs> little bit of something. A little bit of something. A little bit something squishy. Something underneath there. A little yeah, bit I something mean, squishy okay, between the bottom. There's two and the things floor. to consider here, honestly, and I don't know because I've only seen this happen to me once with a subwoofer, and it. it I won't even say the brand, but uh, sometimes the threaded inserts actually mm. go all the way into the box. Uh huh. Like it's a hole, <laughs> so oh, right, okay. it becomes a port oh. <laughs> if you do not put a screw into it or something. Maybe. So, are the feet optional? Maybe, maybe they are optional, but for sure you're going to have to put something underneath the sub to. Yeah, keep I mean, you them, just don't want it directly it, on yeah. your hard floor. It's going to rattle if you don't, and well, perhaps it's, damage it's more itself. likely just going to vibrate your entire house. Yeah, there's that too. Oh, maybe he'd like that. Maybe he'd, you know, think he'd want a maybe butt kicker, but then all the your neighbors, right everyone around is also going to feel that bass, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. you got to do something. So he's he's sending a wireless signal to his PB-1000 now. If he installs butt kickers, can those use a wireless signal too? Yes. As long as they got receivers, yeah. There's no reason why he can't. I don't see why any reason why. No, totally fine. So he knows his room is bare and reflective at the moment. He's working on getting rugs and drapes added. Any suggestions we could offer to help improve his room? Well, rugs are good and drapes are fine, but mm -hmm. really what you need is acoustic panels. And I'm going to scroll back up and look at your... Yep. Okay. No, I, I go you behind need, your seat is first. Is a piece of art behind your head yep. that uh, underneath the E and K sign, you need a nice, long, beautiful piece of art that yep. is actually an acoustic panel. Yeah, a printed acoustic panel. You can get really quite inexpensive ones from Acoustamac. Uh, and they have lots of already like uh, designs where they have the rights to use those images, or you can send them an image, any custom image right. that you have the rights to, uh, and they can print it on a panel for you. Gick can also do that. They have an even larger selection of art. I actually like Gick's uh, website interface for setting mm. up the panels that you want to get. Very nice, but they're a little bit more expensive. Uh, but art panels can totally fit in here. And I mean, anyone, most people like to put up some kind of decoration behind their couch. And this can look like anything, any poster, any image you ever wanted to put up there, except it's also an acoustic panel. Yeah. And uh, you're going to want something on that left wall uh, right by your speaker there. Mm. So another piece of art there would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, your right speaker, if, you know, the first reflection point is uh, someplace in another room. Yes. Don't worry about that Not so much. too worried about that. But it would be <laughs> nice to put something on that left wall next to your front yeah. left speaker so that it's not reflecting quite as strongly when clearly your front right speaker has essentially no wall next to it. Those are really the only two spots I see. Yeah. No. All right. Lior. Lior just upgraded to a Denon X4400H since he wants to expand from 5.1 to Atmos. His room is enclosed, dedicated theater. It's an, it's a, it is an enclosed, dedicated theater. 23 and a half feet long, 11 feet wide, and 8 feet high. It's basically almost exactly the same as my theater. Mine's a little bit wider. Okay. His seats are 11 and a half inches from his 106-inch screen, and due to some uh, room limitations, his surround speakers are farther back, uh, 16 and a half from the screen, and they're up high where Dolby used to recommend placing them, but they yes. do not any longer, though they claim they have no memory of that. <laughs> the surround speakers aren't moving. That's just the way it is. Well, that's fun. Who cares? Yep. He thinks he'd like to try uh, just one pair of overhead speakers to start. He already has a pair of Polk uh, OWM3 that he can use but where should he place them he'd rather not have to remount them in a different position in the future and he does think that he might have spent a four overhead speakers at some point so should he go by the dolby 5.1.2 diagram that shows top middles or should he go by the 5.1.4 diagram that shows top fronts and top rears uh, he'd only be installing one of those pairs uh for now okay i think you should 100 percent go with top middles oh i i do and the reason is is because it your surround speakers are up high and further back which actually yeah. would put them right basically in line with where you might end up putting top rears yeah except on the side walls instead of on the ceiling right but i i, I mm. think that they're gonna this would put them physically further away from those speakers and then your next set of overhead speakers would be top uh front heights or whatever front heights oh. and that's that is because you can't move your your surrounds yeah, because of what you just said, I think that this is the option that 
you know, those, because if you put top rears, I don't think that you're going to be able to hear much of a difference between their location and your surround location and your surround speakers. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's a good that's argument, my, Tom. That's yeah. my, that's my suggestion. Yeah. Cause my initial thought was, oh, just install top fronts. Yeah, because uh, then you can do whatever. But yeah, you're making a very good point. You are convincing me as we speak. Uh, not only that, if you install top middles, those are typically the most noticeable of the overhead right. positions. Uh, so that'll give you a good sense of whether you like this Atmos thing to begin with or this DTSX thing to begin with. Um, yeah, I can dig that. All right. So yeah, top middles. And then if you want to have four overheads, you'll add front heights in the future. All right, sure. I'm on board with that. All right. The Dolby diagram shows all the overhead speakers as being in the same distance apart as the front left and right speakers, but his front left and right speakers are basically in his front corners, probably because of the width of the screen. Mm -hmm. So if he mimicked that spacing with the overhead speakers, they'd be very close to the side walls. Yes. Should he ignore Dolby in this case and have the overhead speakers closer together and away from the side walls a bit? Yes. And the answer is yes. Yes, yeah. that's what you should do. We've yeah. actually addressed this a couple of times in the past, but it does happen. Oh, I yeah. Mean, my... Uh, my top, my my surrounds and stuff, uh, my overhead speakers are kind of in line with my uh, front, my my front speakers, which are very out, very wide because of the the size of my screen. But it is a hundred percent because of the shape of my couch, okay, and nothing to do. Like I would if if I had my way, and they'd be another foot in into the room. Mm -hmm. But excuse me man what is the deal i haven't i haven't sneezed since the last podcast you did sneeze a couple times on the last podcast what is going on I i'm allergic know. to podcasting Must anyways be. if i had my way i would i would move these in a little bit further because it's sort of mm. closer to my usual city location right but because of how my couch is located and where in that shape uh i have to have them out wide so they basically in line now my surround back speakers because of the door at the back of my room are like right, almost right next. They're like right. two and a half feet apart. The way They're THX like the would have to set them up. Yeah. The way that THX used to suggest. But I, the other option was to put them really super wide, which I did not want to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. And now that I haven't done it, it can't be done because I have to open up the walls. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I mean, really yeah. with the overhead speakers, the easiest way to think of it is they should be the, the, the type of distance apart from each other that your front left and right speakers would be. So we normally say front left and right speakers should be at least six feet apart, which means your overhead speakers should be at least six feet apart. Right. And then normally we which probably wouldn't. Couch, usually. Yeah. You know, we unless your screen is really big and you got a really big room and you're very far away, you probably aren't going to have your front left and right speakers more than 10 feet apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And so your overhead speakers probably shouldn't be more than about 10 feet apart from each other. But you do take the room into consideration. You have a fairly narrow room. I agree. You don't want those overhead speakers right up against the side walls. So yeah, if you if they're six or seven feet apart from each other, that's closer together than your front left and right speakers are because of the size of your screen, but that's okay. You don't have to have them exactly the same as your front left, right. Just think of how far apart should front left, right speakers generally be, and my overhead speakers should be a similar distance apart. Hmm. So you, if you want to try out different target curves using Odyssey's editor app, what is the process? Should you always run the Odyssey program, setup program from the editor app, or can you run it directly from the X4400H and then save the results with the app after the fact? I did not find that to be the case, but I went and did some research after uh, this next question that he's mm -hmm. about to ask, and it seems that the Odyssey editor app is... Uh, quirky <laughs> would be a nice way of seeing it as a real nice personality uh. but maybe isn't all there so uh not everybody has had the experience i've had with okay. this but many people have had many different problems that i did not end up having so your mileage may vary i guess is the is the i mean it thing. seems so, the safest thing to do is to run it begin the, the process from the app because that it will tell you to first connect to your AV receiver via the network. Yes. And then plug in the microphone, which begins the Odyssey process. Right. But now we know that your smartphone running the app is connected to that AV receiver. So it's receiving <sighs> all the information. For any reason the receiver or your phone or anything loses connection yes. with the with itself with network, or with the yeah. app network or whatever, then problems. It it, it will you know the 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 thing the whole thing will go down and you have it'll have to start the whole 
you know, uh, yeah. Odyssey Pro the problem. Now, if you do it from the receiver, that will never happen. That has never happened but to me. That I don't know that you Odyssey. can send those results to the app for saving right. purposes. I have some people said that you can, and some they have, yeah. and I did not find that to be the case. Yeah, so. I'd suggest run it from the app. Yeah. Yeah. So he says, Tom, me, mentioned his frustration with the Odyssey Editor app at having to run all the measurements again anytime he made a manual change to the target curve. Mm, I don't remember saying that exactly. But okay. okay. Is that really the way it works? Or is there somewhere he could read more about using the Editor app uh, and hopefully streamline the whole process? Okay. I you If you can streamline the whole process, you should totally write, make a video or write, <laughs> a thing, write it down. Because apparently nobody else has. I did find a YouTube video mm -hmm. that has strange music and no talking from what I could tell and it's all in German. Yes it is. Uh, the writing is all in German. The but you can still make German. out what's going on. So you can they kind of walk you through yeah how to use the uh, the editor app and all this other stuff. Uh now I have read that you can only keep maybe two different configurations and switch between them. But Really? That's what one person said on uh, one of their one star reviews Maybe of they the had an eight gigabyte memory on their smartphone or something. Yeah, that, maybe. I don't that's, know. That's not supposed to be the case. That's not supposed to be the case. But, you know, so, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, they're, they're, I have no way of helping you do this any better because I right. am not ever probably going to open No, when, when you've, so you start the process on the app, you've yeah. connected via the network to your AV yeah. receiver, you plug in the microphone, you do the Odyssey thing. Now the app has all of those measurements. Right. Now in the app, you make all the changes you want to make. You can turn off the mid-range compensation. You can say, don't make any uh, EQ corrections above whatever frequencies you select. You can change the target curve. You do all that. Then you save that configuration in the app. Then you upload it via the network to the AV receiver. Right. But you can do all those changes in the app and then upload it again and you can save and load different configurations so you don't have to remeasure the whole thing every single time you want to make no. a change but you do have to do all the changes in the app and then upload it to the av receiver which is like a five to ten minute process so it's not instantaneous if you want to do a b comparisons you can't do that right but you don't have to do all the measurements again no. again i read somebody's review where they're like it took me 30 minutes to upload the new configuration i'm like you know maybe you should hardwire <laughs> Just yeah just to keep your life a little easier. He lastly, he says, if he expands to 5.1.4 in the future, does he need to do all the Odyssey stuff yet again? Or can he just tell the receiver the distances and levels for the new overhead speakers and have to apply the same Odyssey correction as the rest of the speakers? You're doing it again. That one, you need to do all the measurements again. There's no, you cannot. There's no way you around say, it. say, just trust me. This is the speakers. <laughs> no, when you change the actual configuration of yeah. your system, taking away or adding entire speakers, you have to run all the measurements again. Yeah, okay, I think that I know that we've only done nine questions, but I am extremely. We tired, haven't so even done nine. This will we're be going to, nine. and that might be the last one. We'll see. Let's Ping try pong to do an theater, even ten. Ed. <laughs> Ed has an Xbox One, an Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, and two sons who both like to play Fortnite. I got my gaming computer and uh -huh. my son thinks it's his gaming computer yeah it is not it is uh -huh. got it in downloaded fortnite opened fortnite was scrolling through like all the controls and i went oh this is too much hassle <laughs> Just, i'm like holy crap there are like so many buttons like yeah there's all the l to shift the stuff, map yeah. and stuff l for the map and this for that this for that and the keyboard that came with this thing is like a compact keyboard oh. so everything is like super tight mm. and there's no like little uh, tactile things to let you know where your fingers are supposed to go that keyboard is a nightmare yes so i am gonna have to upgrade that thing eventually okay so, Ed only has one Xbox Live account like most human beings. Uh, they've been playing online for years with just that one Xbox Live account, but now, since they both want to play online at the same time, with one son on the Xbox One and the other son on the Xbox 360, there doesn't seem to be any way to do that without getting a second Xbox Live account. He spoke to a Microsoft uh, customer rep, and they suggested a $100 per year family account, but you can't... All already set up family share but can't you already set up family sharing on the xbox for free why do you have to pay more i'm going to be dead honest with you dude i have always been able to play you know play uh with multiple players on games on the xbox okay like forever and we could not get two players working the other day uh it, it kept asking us to put in another account 
I'm uh-huh. like, it's just a guest. Just create a guest account. And I would create the guest account. The guest account would be there, and it wouldn't let us play. But it would only do it if you can do split screen on one system. We were trying that, and I it see. wouldn't work. Well, Fortnite doesn't do split screen. Well, okay. I'm talking about my problems here. Will you stop focusing all these other people? <laughs> My problem was that split screen wouldn't work, and my kids were bugging me, but and I don't know why. what were you playing? It depends on the game, if it's a split uh, screen or we not. We were playing, I think they were either, either playing, uh, I think they are playing Army of Two, which if that oh. split screen doesn't work on Army of Two, what does it work on? I don't know. I don't yeah. know if it works on Army of Two. I, it I does. I barely ever played that game, so. I like that game. It was stupid, but I like it. But the, it. the problem the here is guns. that you want two people playing not in split screen, on two different systems, so you do diff- need two uh, yeah, Xbox two accounts. Live accounts. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. I don't think there's any way around that. No, the confusion is that. So what? What the customer service rep from Microsoft was talking about? They refer to the Xbox Live Family Pack, which mm. is actually four Xbox Live accounts for a hundred dollars a year. So that's cheaper than getting two separate sixty dollar per year accounts. You're actually getting four accounts for a hundred dollars a year. So that's why it's the Family Pack. The family sharing or family account is when you have one person who makes a purchase, and then within that household, they can share that purchase uh, with other Xboxes. But that doesn't mean you can play online together. It just means right. everyone can access the same pool of software. Right. So there, that's the that's the confusion. That's the difference there. But yeah, the family pack is the most cost efficient. It's a hundred dollars a year instead of sixty dollars a year for just one. But, but that wouldn't help him though, would it? Because he well, yeah. uh, because he's now on two two separate systems at the same time. Yeah, but each son can have their his own Xbox Live account. Ed can keep his Xbox Live account, all three of them. And, you know, your wife, too, can have her own Xbox Live account. Right. Because uh, you get four for $100 a year. All right. So do we still purchase physical media, he asks. we are, He's an audio enthusiast, so he begrudgingly bought Blu-rays. Hey, there's some good audio Blu-rays. Oh, yeah. Even though he didn't really want to repeat his ballooning DVD collection just for the lossless audio experience. And now he's begrudgingly bought an, an Ultra HD Blu-ray player for the same reason. But he's finding that he rarely uses it because streaming is so convenient and the quality has gotten pretty good now. He can't bear to, to par, part with the best audio. So how do we feel? Uh, my mindset on buying discs has changed considerably probably mm-hmm. in the last two years but most significantly probably in the last couple of months well i'm, I'm say i'll say in the last year i stopped going to movies because okay. i wanted to go to movies i started going to movies to support movies right to basically tell the studios i want you to make more of this stuff you know, I went to see the Avengers because I'm like, I want you to make more superhero movies. I no longer have to go to the movies to make them make more superhero movies. I they're think Marvel's going to keep making movies. I think, they're, I think they're, that, that they've gotten the hint. Okay. <laughs> now, I went to see Wonder Woman uh-huh. on Father's Day. <laughs> I think. So, because I wanted to support a female-led superhero movie to tell the studios that that was something I wanted to mm-hmm. see more of. I went to see Black Panther for the exact same reason in the theaters, okay? I didn't go see Deadpool 2 in the theaters because I didn't think I needed to go see Deadpool 2 in the theaters to make them make more Deadpool movies. At this point, it's a <laughs> foregone conclusion. The same thing is with discs. I'm now starting to buy discs, yes, for the audio experience, but a lot more to support those same mm. movies for the same reasons. I want I want you to make more of these things, so I'm going to buy the ones that are here now. Okay. Because I agree with you. Streaming has gotten so convenient, and mm-hmm. it's so good most of the time, that I'm like, even the Xbox One screwing up the audio doesn't even make me that angry <laughs> anymore. You know, I'm still able to enjoy Doctor Strange on Netflix. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm still able to enjoy all these things. So I... I, I agree. There are some things I buy because I want the best audio or whatever, but there are... Now I'm more buy. I'm more s- sending messages to studios by okay. my purchases. Yeah, I still buy physical media. I'm still buying Ultra HD Blu-rays and, and some Blu-rays. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I'm paranoid because uh, on movie services like Netflix or whatever, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. stuff does go away. It does. And so if anything that I want to keep, like even I'm even hesitant and like, because I'm really tempted to move over to just iTunes because like iTunes is going to have Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. Uh, yes, it's lossy, right? But 
like you say, it's getting pretty good. Yeah. It's really not a yeah. terrible experience at all. Um, but even even Apple, I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to build this huge iTunes library and one day Apple goes belly up. I'm like, if I buy the discs, I got those things forever. And I, I back them See, up, I, so, I, I, yeah. I kind of feel like the streaming right now has made it so much easier for me to wait for sales. Like, yes, I yeah. really yeah, want yeah, all yeah. three of the Captain America movies because yeah. I think they're all excellent. I want the first Thor movie really badly because even though a lot of people don't like it, I thought it was a lot of fun mm-hmm. and I, I enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, you know, I would like to go through and get all of the movies that I really like out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, and other places too. Like next time that DC makes a movie that doesn't suck, I'm definitely going to want to buy it just for the novelty of might, it. Might be a while. Okay. <laughs> Everyone at Comic Con thought Shazam looked fun, so maybe maybe Shazam. I thought he looks like he's wearing a, a muscle outfit. Yeah, but that's the point. He's supposed I, to be silly. I, it's I understand, but I'm not. I watched that preview on my cell phone, so I'm going to see it on the big screen okay. probably after this podcast, and we'll see. But uh, yeah, I mean, there, it's just it's making it a lot easier for me to wait for sales, basically. All right, Jared. Jared has a pair of Gick Acoustics two four four panels with uh, it's, it's a four inch absorption panel, and he's got a one and a quarter inch air gap behind it for you know just over five inch panel thickness total, I guess. Yeah, but that's anyway. that's the way the two four four panels come. They come. Oh, with they that come air with that, that air in. gap already. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all right. So he wants to ch- to change from a burgundy color that he went with. So he still likes Gick, so we think he'll order some DIY materials and, and give them a try for making the panels himself this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wait, what? <laughs> so the panels are already wrapped, right? That's right. Do you know but what he's... the outside of those, uh, what's the frame of those things are made of? Uh, just wood. It's just wood. So why don't you just buy some material and cover your you, current you could. panels? You, know you, could, you could undo the staples that are holding in your current fabric and just replace the fabric. That's yeah, absolutely 100% could. what I would do. Yes. That's I'm in agreement. But let's maybe he wants to get more panels. So he's thinking That's the, fine. the additional panels he'll build himself DIY, but he'll get the materials for that DIY panels from Gick. Right. So Gick sells Owen Coring and Knopf, Knopf, whatever, Ecos, Ecosi. I don't know what they're called. Ecos, anyway, yeah. it's, it's another insulation. Yeah. But there are different price points and densities. What's the best choice for a wall panel with an air gap behind it? And would a different choice be better for making corn drill? I didn't see the price point difference. The six two-inch panels of Ecos was exactly the same price as the six two-inch panels of Owen's Corn stuff. But that it, was with higher density Ecos versus lower density Owen's Corning. If you go with the higher density Owen's Corning, you only get five two-inch thick uh, panels for even more money than six of the denser Ecos panels. So, yeah, there's densities and there's different price points. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know that... I didn't know that there was any difference between these things at all, to be honest with you. Well, I didn't it. so the Owens Corning is physically more rigid. Uh, the mm. Owens Corning 703 or 705, and those are the two different densities. The 703 is less dense than right. the 705. Uh, those are the type of uh, fiberglass insulation that you would normally put in a basement where it's going right up against the concrete and you use those like plastic discs to hold it directly on. No mm-hmm. type of framing or anything around it. Whereas the Ecos insulation is it's um, kind of similar to uh, to like rock wool in its structural integrity. So it's stiffer than the pink stuff, but it's not quite as rigid as the Owens Corning. So basically, if you are going to build some kind of wooden frame to hold your panel, uh, I think the Ecos is great. It's a little bit less expensive, hmm. and uh, but it's not quite as physically rigid. If you just want to make a panel where you're not actually putting it in a wooden frame and you're just going to wrap some raw insulation, that's where you'd really want that Owens Corning because it's it's structural uh, structurally strong enough all by itself that it you don't even really need a frame for it that frame right. is more for looks than for structure so i'd base it on that if you're going to build a wood structure i'd save some money and get the ecos so gick sells Gel- Gulf- gulford of maine acoustic transparent acoustically transparent fabric for panel oh, covers we should just mention about the density thing because oh yeah go ahead it, it doesn't it doesn't make a large difference on the acoustic yeah, properties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really doesn't. For base traps, definitely get the lowest density Ecos insulation, and you just cut it into the triangles because it's lighter weight because it's less dense for the, for filling the same amount of area. 
right. uh, and that's what you want because you want to be able to build that thing up as you know triangle wedges in your corners if you're building those big those big corner base traps out of this stuff DIY. Um, so yeah, go for the least lower dense stuff, and then for the wall panels, just decide if you're building the the wooden thing, then go with the low density ecos that's easy to use. If you're not going to build uh, wooden frames, then go with the Owens Corning. Yeah. Okay, but uh, fabric. Uh, Good. Go for the main acoustically transparent fabric uh, panels for panel covers, and he likes the smoother look of the Anchorage series fabrics. He wants to go with a neutral gray this time. He, he uses a bias light, so he'd like to know which fabric color will result, result in the most accurate non-color biased result when his bias light stri is shining on it. Mm -hmm. He's leaning either towards wolf or slate. Which one? Uh, or is there a better option than one of those? So he's got a bias light behind his TV. He's going to put panels on that wall behind that TV, and he wants the if the bias light hits it. He mm -hmm. wants it to still look the right color. It's not going to That's color right. shift. It's not going to shift the color in some direction. Right. So yeah. I don't so know. He wants, a, he wants a neutral gray. Right. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure what you should do is get some some swatches, which Guilford of Maine can send to you directly. Yep. Uh, you can request color swatches, but of course you have to ask them which watches to get now the slate that you talked about is one of the lighter shades mm. and it's within their blue palette so it's a it's definitely got a blue tinge to it that mm. slate one uh they have another one called goose which is <laughs> about similarly as dark of a gray but it's slightly red it's within their kind of red palette. So they have what appears to be their very neutral gray palette where it starts with what they call onyx for like a pure black. And uh, and then it has two other ones. Wolf is one of them that he was considering, which is a darker shade of gray than either the slate or the goose, but appears to be very neutral. Uh, and then they have another one called graphite, which is even a little bit darker than that, which is which appears to be a very neutral gray. So it's in between the onyx and the wolf. Um, so yeah, he, he was saying he's not quite sure how dark he wants to go. I tend myself, I tend to like darker panels because I like the contrast. Um, and then when the light's shining on it, you don't really notice it so much. But I think the wolf out of all of these is probably the safest bet. It seems to be kind of in the middle in terms of how deep a shade of gray it is. And it's within that very neutral gray palette that they have. Whereas the other ones are either in the blue palette or the red palette. So I'd probably but lean wolf. They probably can request more than one. I'm sure. All right. I, I know that we didn't do a ton of questions, but I'm done. But we had some so. very long ones. No, we yeah. got an even 10. I'm happy with that. All right. Well, we're done. So okay. who we got left? We have Caesar, Brandon N., Sushmit, who contacted me on Twitter, Ilongo, Luke K., who also got in touch with me on Twitter, and then some updates from Infinite Gear. It's Garrett. Luke Cage. Did he want to know how to fix walls in his... Well, he spells it with a K, so it's not that Luke Cage. It's Maybe Luke he's K. undercover. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Luke Cage is very good at his pseudonym stuff. It's just his name, like just mixed up. Name. He didn't even try. <laughs> All right. Uh, once again, let's thank our listeners of the week. We're going to thank Corey, David, Michael, and Earl for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and giving us a PayPal donation. Thank you, gentlemen. Those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for our hosting and other fees. Mm -hmm. Corey, David, Michael, and Earl, thank you so much for those donations. I also want to thank our 61 patrons over at patreon.com. Yeah, patreon.com slash avrantpodcast if you'd like to send up for a monthly uh, subscription. Well, monthly donation, automatic donation to us. Uh, and that's uh, thanks so much to our 61 patrons over there. I also want to thank Bob and Rob for talking us up to Optima and Acoustic Panels Canada, respectively. Yeah, Bob, Rob, thank you very much for the support and congrats on those purchases. And for AV Rant, I am Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. Is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.